How's it going, everybody? My name is Ron Sparkman, and I am the Chief Curiosity Correspondent at the Space Foundation Discovery Center, and we're excited to have you join us today for Launch Day Live, Launch America. Uh, it's a really, really big show. Uh, we're really excited. We're going to be doing it all day. Even if it's scrubbed, we're going to keep this show going for the next three hours with some amazing guests. Uh, first up, let's uh, go ahead and introduce uh, two of my to my cohorts. I'm not really their cohort. I'm really kind of their, their, their underling, their minion. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad to have them on today. We have Kevin Arrangers, who is the executive director of the Space Foundation Discovery Center. Rich Cooper, who is the vice president of strategic communications and outreach at the Space Foundation. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. This is huge. I'm so excited to be here with you today. It's excited to be here day. with you. It's launch day. There is no better than <laughs> launch day. Uh, it, this is an exciting time. Uh, we really can't say enough about it. Like this is this is huge. It's been a long time coming, and for the first time, we're going to see some incredible things. So I'm just going to read some details to everybody real quick, just about what you're going to see today for this launch. Uh, so this is NASA's uh, first attempt to launch American astronauts from American soil for the first time since the retirement of the space shuttle in 2011, almost a decade. Uh, you know, so there's been a lot that's gone into this between the tests, everything that SpaceX has done, uh, Boeing as well as looking at eventually doing the, the same thing. We have so much uh, that's going to happen today and it's all going to be really, really exciting. Uh, so uh, the mission officially called Demo 2 will attempt its launch today at 4.33 uh, 4 p.m. Eastern time. So it's going to be 1.33 p.m. here in Mountain Time. Um, if you live outside of this time zone, you get to watch with us. We're going to be streaming the entire launch today. We're going to take a break from this stream to, to show all of that. Uh, whenever we come back, I may have some tears in my eyes. So hopefully I can get to go all Walter Cronkite on you. Be like, well, I took Cronkite here. Uh, uh, so I'm really excited for that. So this is going to be the final test launch of the crewed version of SpaceX's Dragon spacecraft, which is going to launch on the Falcon 9 rocket today. And the first time that a crew will test spacecraft systems in active flight. If successful, the crew will arrive at the International Space Station in around 24 hours. This is part of NASA's commercial pro uh, crew program, which employs the hardware developed by private companies like SpaceX. The Dragon spacecraft that will be used for DM2 will be capable of staying in space for upwards of 200, uh, I'm sorry, 110 days. NASA will determine how long the actual, actual mission will last upon successful docking with the ISS. When the Dragon undocks, it will splash down just off Florida's Atlantic coast. SpaceX's Go Navigator recovery vessel will retrieve the Dragon and its crew. Uh, so, gentlemen, this is a really, really exciting time. I mean, Kevin, this is, you know, what, what do you think about this? This is going to be kind of, kind of cool for you. This is your first launch as the SFDC director. Yeah, and I, as you can see, I'm orbiting in our Space Foundation Discovery Center uh, satellite above Mars, right? Uh, definitely a historic day. And uh, actually, I'm here on site at the Space Foundation Discovery Center uh, here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Truly an historic day for us as we send American astronauts back into space via a SpaceX rocket. So um, you know me, Ron and, uh, and Rich. Uh, I'm a rockets guy. So it's a special day for the Discovery Center. It's a special special day for all of us uh, here in the United States and again across the globe uh, as we go back into space. And in terms of the Space Foundation Discovery Center, uh, we are, of course, closed to the public uh, due to COVID restrictions, but we aren't closed at all. We're actually virtual uh, on discoverspace.org. Uh, all of our educational lessons via our auxiliary auxilia platform, uh, as well as fantastic virtual live programming like we're doing right here, is all a part of what we're doing. So our doors aren't closed. They're open uh, to everyone, to all of you, each and every day, virtually. And uh, Kevin, we're, we're glad to have you on today. And uh, it, we've got some really exciting things that are happening throughout the show this afternoon. We're going to talk to uh, a retired astronaut about a little bit about what's going on um, with the, the astronauts today, uh, Paul Lockhart. Uh, we have the Lieutenant Governor is going to be joining us later. We're going to talk a little bit about space in our state, not with ju just with her, but with the uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation's uh, John, who's going to jump on and talk to us about the things that are happening with Dream Chaser. There's just so many things that are happening, and it's an exciting time to be a part of this. Um, so we're really glad to have you, Rich. Um, you're a big space fan, so let's talk <laughs> a little bit about this for you. This is kind of it's kind of your thing a little bit. So how's it feel? You know, uh, were you at the last launch? Were you at the last uh, uh, shuttle launch uh, in 2011? I wasn't at the last one. Um, I, I, I have seen about a dozen of them, and each one of them is special, but I can't help but think of watching, this reminds me in many ways of April 1981, mm. when we had this other lull in our space launch capacity. We had uh, the last launch prior to uh, April 91, uh, 81, excuse me, uh, the shuttle uh, was the Apollo Soyuz. And, uh, you know, again, this was a, 
big test flight of what was going to go on. And I remember getting up early that morning, watching the then three major news networks and the morning shows and watching all of that and the whole anticipation of that. This has a very different feel, but the part that is so exciting about this is that more people get to play in this one. And, and you're not dependent on just the regular news networks. You know, we get to share this content with you. Uh, the astronauts and through social media and all the other tools get to take us all along. The other wicked cool thing is, things are, you know, the camera footage that you now get. Uh, and it, what SpaceX has done and NASA has done to, you know, literally take us along for the ride. Uh, I know there are some people who probably do get vertigo when they watch some of this footage. But, you know, for a lot of us, that may be the closest we get. But it's a hell of a ride. And it's a hell of an emotional ride for everybody on this. It's exciting. It's historic. It's another one of those dates. We space cadets circle on the calendar and say, remember when we watched this one? This is what's exciting. History is unfolding and we get to be part of it. And uh, I think that it really we, we couldn't put any better than that. It's this is history. We get to watch history for the first time. And this is the first steps to a lot. Um, this is the uh, beginning of the Artemis missions. This is the beginning of what's going to be the first woman and the next man on the moon. This is going to be what, how NASA eventually has the first boot steps on Mars. Um, so it's it's incredible to be a part of this today. This is something that uh, we love to be um, here for you and share with you. Uh, and thank you so much for showing us and joining in with us this afternoon. Um, so, Kevin, uh, let's talk a little bit about what's going on with SFDC over there. Uh, tell us a bit about you know, what we have, um, you know, what people can check out. Now, there's been all kinds of stuff. If, if you're just joining us, the first time you've been a part of one of these live streams, um, tell us a little bit about what people can find on discoverspace.org. They can find it all, Ron. Anything from the uh, educational uh, arena or realm with STEM and STEM-based programming, again, via our auxilia, auxilia platform. Um, they'll be able to find classroom activities, uh, virtual uh, opportunities, live webinars uh, for students and teachers, and of course, uh, our general public. One of the things we wanted to do in this uh, downtime, this closed period for the Discovery Center, is again, to continue to remain open and give people an opportunity to learn a lot about our, our artifacts and our objects throughout our gallery and our, our labs, and being able to provide those as recorded opportunities, as well as live, live webinars. Uh, and this launch opportunity um, that we're doing here via this live format is the first of many to come. Uh, so we're going to be doing some live webinars. Uh, we'll be doing a space-based variety show, uh, again, bringing to you all things uh, current events uh, within space, space research, space exploration, and again, trying to connect everybody uh, to space because space is really a part of our everyday life. We have a motto here in the Space Foundation Discovery Center um, that we say no one goes to space alone and we can't either. So our students, our teachers, our guests that come uh, to the Discovery Center every day, we're still uh, joining them virtually uh, as part of these opportunities. And right behind me over my head here uh, is our science on a sphere. It's our immersive laboratory. Um, we can uh, do all kinds of virtual programming and live streaming with our science on a sphere via data sets that are provided to us by the kind folks at NOAA. Uh, it's a fantastic teaching tool for us, both in person and again, virtually, as well as our Mars Robotics Laboratory, um, where we, we have 3D printed rovers that enable um, folks to actually drive rovers on the surface of Mars. Uh, so it gives us an opportunity to allow all of our guests, even through this COVID-19 closure period, to remain uh, with us, um, for us to remain virtual and connect to them, and much, much, much more to come. And, uh, you know, you were, in fact, in front of one of my favorite things with the SOS. And I uh, already had a couple people ask on one of the streams, like, hey, is this the SOS? Yes, it is. That answered that. So everybody's always happy to see it. It's one of our favorite tools to use to educate. Uh, we do live streams on there all the time. I love doing it and, uh, and talking with people. And uh, we're really excited about all the things that are going on at the SFDC, Kevin. So uh, thank you for joining in with us today. So just so everybody knows, about every 10 minutes or so, we're going to jump to uh, another amazing topic about what's going on in the world of space and science today. So we were glad to start off with uh, our, the executive director 
of the uh, our Discovery Center, uh, Space Foundation Discovery Center. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Thanks, Rich. Uh, this is going to be a banner day. So, folks, continue to tune in. Uh, you're, you're in for some really fantastic stuff a bit later today. So thank you all. And please, if you're in Colorado Springs, please come by the Space Foundation Discovery Center right on Garden of the Gods Road. And if you can't, again, please join us every single day via uh, our website, discoverspace.org. So thank you guys. Have fun. Uh, again, tune in throughout the day and enjoy an historic day. Bye, folks. Bye, Kevin. We'll see you soon. Uh, so, Rich, let's uh, let's dive into some other details of what we've got going on, um, you know, with with the Space Foundation as a whole. We talked a little bit about the Discovery Center. Uh, you know, we're going to have a, a little something special a little bit later um, that was produced by our COO. Um, and uh, Shelly's going to be on there. Shelly Brunswick's going to be talking a little bit about CINE. But can you give us a little tease about what we're going to see today? Today, uh, the we, all, we don't have one launch. We have two launches. So this is huge for Space Foundation. We do have two launches. And uh, earlier today, we did release. Uh, uh, we had liftoff from the pad, the Center for Innovation and Education. This is an effort by the Space Foundation to drive workforce development and expand economic opportunity. Uh, at the Space Foundation, we really do believe there is space for everybody. And when you have a global space economy that's $415 billion and over 80 nations operating and literally touches every citizen, country, community, and continent, you know, there is opportunity to be had. And so what we at the Space Foundation are going to be looking to do is providing our leadership, our network, our capacity to help workers, help students, help entrepreneurs, help innovators find their place within that space economy, build those relationships, build those capacities and get them involved. Uh, whether people realize it or not, space is a part of your life every day. It's not just the weather report. It's not just the GPS on your phone. It is everything from financial transactions to agriculture to, again, you name it, there's a space connection to it. And as we've all watched what's happened with the COVID-19, a lot of the things that we've seen that have been taking, helping take care of people, you know, the personal protective equipment, uh, the thermometers, a lot of the other medical instruments all have a space heritage. And so the investments that we make that take us above have huge opportunities and rewards for us back down here on Earth. And that's where, again, in a few weeks, uh, our research and analysis team uh, here at the Space Foundation, we're going to be releasing what was or what was the space economy number for the year 2019. And uh, this past year, when we crunched those numbers, we uh, had figured that the space economy, the global space economy, was just under $415 billion. Um, I expect that number to be somewhere in the same ballpark. Uh, the numbers that we do release will be pre-COVID. Uh, we know that there will be some type of economic impact as that impact has been had upon everybody. But again, the space economy has a place for everyone. And one of the things that we do at the Space Foundation, besides space-inspired education and service to the space community, is space awareness. And one of the things I I take great pride in and everyone in the organization who is an ambassador for the larger space community, we see it as a great opportunity and as a stewardship role of bringing more tables to the space community table. If we can bring more chairs to the table and bring more insight, that increases capacity, that increases, that creates creativity, that creates relationships that make great things happen. And I think anytime you go to bring people to the table, as we do every year with symposium, what we do for our space in the community events, what we do online with our auxilia programming, plus the other work that goes on uh, by members of our team internationally with other space agencies, let alone here in Washington, D.C., where I operate with the uh, Washington operations team. We bring people together. We are a steward for the space community. It's a role that we are humbled and very happy to have. But we see CINE as an opportunity to bring more people to that table and create more of that economic opportunity. It was uh, the, Kevin mentioned earlier the phrase uh, that we use, no one goes to space alone. Um, we really believe that. Uh, it's a team of teams that make these things happen, and we're going to do everything we can to keep building that team and making it even stronger. 
it's it really is it's an exciting time and again we're going to have a video with that, that Shelly brunswick our coo is going to uh we're going to be sharing that a little bit later actually right before the launch so uh stick around for that again so many amazing guests today but rich we've only got a few more minutes with you so uh definitely want to touch on something that's important to everybody space symposium we had to move it just a couple of weeks out and obviously there were some really big changes and uh, we know that we're going to be uh, looking at the event for the fall so can you give us a bit of update tell people a little bit about what space symposium is so that way they know if it's the first time you've ever seen us ever been uh, ever joined before we've got a lot of people watching right now um so maybe there's some new faces here so give us a little bit of breakdown of what space symposium is and then uh, what people can expect um coming this fall Every year, we at the Space Foundation literally bring the world space community together in Colorado Springs. It's hosted at the Broadmoor uh, Resort in Colorado Springs, and literally, uh, you can name just you can name any country that's operating in space, and the odds are that they've got people that are there. It's not unusual for us to have anywhere between thirteen to fifteen thousand people uh, from around the world. Those are people who are working in industry, working in government, working in civilian agencies, working with, with the military, research community, investors, whatever those persons might be. They're members of the space community that come together under the space um, under the space symposium umbrella to share ideas, to see what is happening, hear the policy discussions hear what is happening in all of these different arenas, but most of all, they're building their own capacity. And by building that capacity, what am I talking about? I'm talking about partnerships that uh, allow them to expand their business. I'm talking about relationships that can help them take their technology and the programs that they have been working on to the next level. They may be looking for another collaborator who, who maybe offers that missing piece of the puzzle that they're looking for. But again, it is a shared community of interest that comes from around the world that wants to know what's happening commercially, uh, via national security, economic security, all of those pieces. It is a newsmaking event with newsmakers. In the past, we've had the vice president, we've had heads of space agencies, major CEOs, as well as some of the very historic pioneers who have been part of the space community from its beginning. Uh, one of the highlights that we do do at Symposium uh, is are, are a number of the awards that we go to give out. We have the Swigert Award for Exploration, which will be given to members of the JPL team for the Mars Insight Program this past year. And then we will, uh, but our big award is our General Hill Award. That will be going to Gene Kranz of Apollo 13 fame, uh, whereas many people will go to quote him, failure is not an option. That's the line that Ed Harris gave. That wasn't the line that Gene Kranz used, but it is the line that is certainly tied to him as he as to his place in history. So we'll be honoring him. We have a number of other honorees that we'll be doing. Uh, those other honorees will include the International Space Station program. This year's program, uh, since we had to move from the original dates uh, in March, um, we've rescheduled the program from October 31st to November 2nd. And on the evening of November 2nd, uh, at the closing dinner, we will be recognizing the 20 years of achievement of humans living off of the planet on the International Space Station. And we'll be recognizing the five international partners and hopefully working a couple different surprises, uh, some surprise guests that will be a part of that evening's program. We'll also be honoring the National Air and Space Museum for what they did this past year in literally bringing the world back together to relive the Apollo 11 uh, launch and, and landing and mission here on the National Mall. I will say I never, having lived in the DC area for, well, let's just say well over 30 years at this point, uh, never thought I would see the Washington Monument as a movie screen, but it worked and it was fabulous. So again, those are a couple of things that we are going to have done. Um, because the symposium has traditionally been sort of over a four day period, well, this year it is a bit truncated, but people can still expect to see the exhibits that we have there. Uh, we're gonna have a full exhibit hall uh, that has been expanded courtesy of the Broadmoor, but they're going to be able to see some of the hardware, talk to the engineers, talk to the people who are behind that. But one of the things that we want people to know is that we're going to be following all of the federal, state, and local guidelines to make sure anyone and everybody who comes to the symposium can have a successful experience, but also have a safe experience. 
We know we're all operating in a very, very unique atmosphere right now. Um, we're all trying to figure out what is, how we go about what we will call a new normal. There's still a lot of questions that we have to answer, but one of the things that people will have our commitment on is that you're going to have a successful symposium program, but you're also going to have a safe symposium program. We are going to do everything to allow your success and your safety to be paramount in everything that we do. As to other pieces for the program, people can expect to see some of the major leaders from the Pentagon, as well as international space agencies. Uh, you know, the things that you come to expect from a symposium, you're still going to get. Now, you're going to be getting them beginning on October 31st. Let's face it, no one has better costumes than the space community. Um, I'm sure there are going to be a few surprises that we go to share with people that particular day, but then uh, that will be Saturday, October 31st, and then we'll have programming that afternoon, an opening ceremony that evening where we will celebrate and honor Gene Kranz, and then the first and second will be two full days of programming that people expect to see and will see. Uh, that's incredible. Uh, I, I'm really excited to see what we do with this, and uh, I know that so much had to change and uh, that's really what Space Foundation is great at. You know, we became the Digital Space Foundation very quickly. We've been able to do uh, a lot of um, a lot of things and, and pivot very quickly. And we hope that everybody's enjoying all the stuff that we've been up to, all the education programs and the Space for You lives. Thank you, everybody that's been joining us for that. And Rich, uh, we're so glad to have you on today. Um, we're going to actually, just in case something happens and they have to scrub, uh, Rich has got a, a multitude of experiences from launches past. So uh, if so, we're going to do this whole event uh, all the way through, and we'll talk a little bit about the reasons that sometimes those things need to, be hap uh, need to happen. Safety is important, and uh, the lives of the astronauts are paramount. They're number one, and they're going to make the right decision. So the, there is some storms uh, that are possible in the, uh, in the region today. So just uh, keep that in mind as we uh, as we get closer to launch time, which is a little more than an hour and 10 minutes away. So uh, we're really excited. Rich, thank you for so much for coming on today. We appreciate you, and we'll see you in a bit. Thanks, Ron. Awesome. All right, all right. Lou, how's it going there, sir? Good to see you. Uh, so, Lou, we, uh, we're just waiting a, a little bit. It looks like we had just a bit of an issue with uh, with Rachel having um, some, some problems on her side. But just in case, what I want to do is just go ahead and say hello and look at this. Right on time. We love it. Rachel uh, Rachel English, our curator and registrar at the Space Foundation Discovery Center, is joining us now. And uh, she's going to be joined, as you see here, Lou Ramon, who is a wonderful person that we'd love to have on the SFDC uh, team, the uh, Space Foundation Discovery uh, Center team as a volunteer. And he is also a retired um, NASA uh, rocket scientist, rocket engineer. So we're glad to have you. And Rachel, welcome in. Hi. Thanks, Ron. Hi, Lou. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. How you doing? Looking forward to uh, sight and launch a little bit. Hi, Rachel. Hi. So I was thinking that today I, we would just start by chatting a little bit on what your background is and how you got involved with NASA. Well, the you know my background uh, was a long time ago. Uh, I worked for NASA in Houston at uh, the Manned Spacecraft Center and later Johnson Space Center. Uh, for almost 50 years. Uh, started there right out of college and was lucky enough to be able to participate in most of the early manned space flights, uh, starting with Gemini. And uh, got to work Gemini, Apollo, Skylab, shuttle, and then building the space station. So it's been a, a real exciting career and I'm very glad uh, today to see us getting back in the human space flight launch business again. It's been way too long. Can you share with us um, kind of a fun anecdote or story from your Apollo days? Yeah, I guess uh, to me, one of the more interesting little things I had in Apollo was getting to work uh, Apollo 11. I was on what they called the uh, flight crew support team. That was a team of, of five people, five guys that reported directly to Neil Armstrong. And we were responsible for making sure that everything that was done on the spacecraft and in the spacecraft was satisfactory and safe for him. My job happened to be uh, what they called the lunar module crew station engineer. And uh, that meant I was responsible to Neil for everything that he would operate, touch and work on inside and outside the lunar module Eagle. And I guess one of the, the things that I remember most was, oh, geez, 
one time shortly before launch, Neil came up to me, you know, and we had the food and all that stuff packaged already, ready to go into the spacecraft. And um, Neil asked if it'd be possible to add some lifesavers uh, to the, the meal kit, which was pretty meager, I must add, uh, just to give them something that would be a little more flavorful, a little tangy. And I said, sure, Neil, I can do that. Uh, first place I went was to our head dietitian, a very fine lady named Rita Rapp, to make sure that adding candy uh, to the food stuff on the, on the lunar module wouldn't mess up any medical experiments. And she assured me that was okay. And then the next step before we could actually put it on board the spacecraft was a routine thing of going to the safety panel. And uh, they surprised me by saying I couldn't add lifesavers uh, to the lunar module. What they were afraid of was in the very dry 100% oxygen environment uh, in the lunar module cabin, that if the astronauts bit down on their lifesaver, they might cause a spark that could cause a fire. So I had to go back and tell Neil I couldn't add lifesavers. He was not happy. He made some comments about what kind of an engineer I was if I couldn't even get <laughs> lifesavers on board his lunar module. So uh, after I made he and Buzz promise, cross their hearts, hope to die, that uh, they would not bite down on the lifesavers, but only suck on them. Uh, I had to sneak in about two o'clock in the morning and cut some security seals and things like that. And wow. stuck in a couple of lifesaver packages into their meal kits. And uh, I trust that uh, they kept their word because we didn't have any sparks or fires or anything. And uh, <laughs> they both made it to the moon and back okay. But that's part of the stuff in, in space flight that you, you do just to get things done. It's It's not exciting. It's it's not glamorous. It's just the mundane day-to-day -day stuff that has to be done in order to get a flight off. I'm sure there are going to be some pretty good stories after this flight, too, related to what they had to do last-minute things to get Absolutely. ready. Absolutely. Well, let's hope they have some good snacks on board with them. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. So with all of your experience, you've worked on so many different space pro programs and projects. Can you kind of tell us why it's so important for us to be going back to the moon, hopefully to stay? Well, I think going back to the moon is got a couple of things. It's, it's a logical progression of where we are. Uh, I look ahead and look at the, the hope, the thought that we're going to go and explore Mars someday. And I think the moon is a perfect stepping stone for that. Uh, it gives us a place to test techniques to test equipment and things like that in deep space that we just can't do here on Earth. And it's not practical to do and wait till we go to, to Mars to do. Uh, the other side of the coin of setting up a, a lunar base is to me a big unknown. And that is what we actually will be able to do in, in terms of mining and retrieving resources from the moon. Uh, we, we know now that it has water, uh, liquid, well, frozen water, ice on it, uh, and we can extract that ice, we can make rocket fuel, so we can use this as a stepping stone and a fueling station. I don't know what else, other things that, that I can't imagine we may discover in setting up a permanent base on the moon, but I think just the technologies that we'll develop is gonna be a lot like what we did going, going to the moon initially. We had no idea of the kind of spin-offs and applications that everyday humans uh, get to see and get to participate with uh, that come from this kind of exploration. Fantastic. Is there anything about today's launch that you're particularly excited to see? Just the idea that we are finally, again, after nine years, uh, being able to launch our own astronauts on our own rocket ships from the United States. You know, we consider ourselves a spacefaring nation, but when you turn around and look at it, that we've not had the ability to put our own people in space for nine years. I mean, that that's hardly a, a, a recommendation for the, the technological capabilities that we have in this country. So I'm really excited on that. I'm excited to see how the new technologies play out 
looking inside and outside of the of the crew dragon capsule uh it's a whole different world than what i'm used to you know there's not a hand controller or a mechanical switch in sight yeah it's super exciting well i know that you and i can just chat about this stuff all day but i think we have to hand it back over to ron so we can meet some other cool guest stars for today's show uh, really seriously, thank you so much, uh, Rachel and uh, Lou. Both of you are always uh, so incredible at the Space Foundation Discovery Center. Uh, Lou, uh, normally whenever things are are you know kind of normal, uh, non-COVID, uh, Lou is there on Wednesdays and he always has amazing stories to share. Uh, I try to pick his brain as much as I can, and uh, um, you know, Rich is in uh, is backstage right now, so I don't want to talk about how many times that I've stopped to be like, Lou, tell me a story when I should have been working. So, uh, Lou, we we love having you, and Rachel, you're always incredible. Thank you so much for all the stuff you're doing, and if you uh, really like what both Rachel and Lou have to say, do make sure to uh, check out discoverspace.org. We have videos from both of them. If you were excited about what happened with cookies in space, you can check out the one where Rachel and Lou talked to us not too long ago with Kevin O'Rangers about uh, what it was like to work uh, on the rocket engine. So check that out and uh, we will see you both very, very soon. Thank you for joining. Thanks. Thank you for letting us. Love it. All right, everybody. Up next, we have our next guest, who uh, is the incredible Anna Cristina Alvera, and she is going to share with us everything that's happening today. We have a large Spanish-speaking audience, and we want to make sure that uh, we we get out all the details today. So she's going to share with us everything that she does. Uh, she does uh, incredible work as a TV uh, media host in Mexico City, Mexico, and she is also uh, one of the correspondents for NASA and Español. Uh, you can check out on YouTube, and she does all kinds of incredible things. So Anna, thank you so much for joining the show today. Thank you, Ron. Thank you so much for the invitation and for being inclusive with the Spanish speaking audience. Uh, I'm very, very excited about what's happening today. And of course, about being able to share with you a little briefing in Spanish about the whole mission so you know exactly what's going on. So uh, if you don't mind, also I have a very special guest with me. Maybe some of you recognize it. <laughs> yes, that's awesome. Uh, so, so if, if everybody doesn't know, I love that she brought that up. Uh, and thank you. That gives me the perfect time to plug our uh, the Space Foundation Discovery Center store. Um, so that is a Celestial Buddy and one of those launched to space on a recent SpaceX launch. And uh, they became very, very famous and they were hard to get a hold of, but I'm pretty sure that we have some there. So uh, th that's that's the perfect person uh, to, or, uh, well, I guess I'm, um, I'm kind of making it a person, right, uh, to have one with you today. <laughs> Exactly. This one uh, was on board demonstration mission one uh, of the Crew Dragon. So now he's watching from Earth, but I'm sure he's as excited as all of us. So if you don't mind, I'm going to start speaking in Spanish for all our Spanish speaking audience. Bueno, pues, hola amigos, yo soy Ana Cristina Olvera. A lo mejor me reconocen porque eh, pues eh, llevo algunos años trabajando con diferentes organizaciones medios de comunicación en, en México y América Latina, divulgando sobre ciencia y el espacio, y también con eh, la NASA, la NASA en español. Desde hace unos tres años hemos estado eh, pues haciendo contenido en español para pues los más de 500 millones de hispanohablantes que existen en todo el mundo y que seguramente están muy interesados en saber lo que sucede en el espacio. Pues hoy es un día muy especial es un gran día para los vuelos espaciales tripulados porque la, la NASA va a hacer su primer vuelo de prueba o vuelo de demostración de su programa comercial para tripulación o Commercial Crew Program. Este programa se empezó a planear desde el 2010, un año antes de la retirada en el 2011 del Space Shuttle o transbordador espacial. Y bueno, la intención era que Estados Unidos pudiera unir fuerzas con eh, la industria privada para poder, empezar a, para poder empezar a abrir eh, todo este eh, espacio que se conoce como órbita baja terrestre a la industria privada, a que haya más acceso, más, más negocio y que todos podamos tener mayor acceso al espacio. Entonces, se empieza a planear y finalmente en el 2014 se adjudican dos contratos a dos empresas una es Boeing, que mucha, seguramente muchos conocen, sobre todo por los aviones que fabrican, pero también hacen naves espaciales. Y la otra es SpaceX, la compañía de nuestro Tony Stark de la vida real, Elon Musk, que pues ha sido quien ha logrado crear cohetes reutilizables y hacer mucho más accesible el espacio. 
La nave de Boeing, que se llama Starliner, pues todavía sigue en pruebas, pero la nave de SpaceX, que es Crew Dragon o Dragon para tripulación, pues parece que ya está lista y a unos pocos minutos de despegar en su vuelo, en su primer vuelo de demostración con dos astronautas, eh, Bob Benken y Doug Hurley, quienes pues tienen la misión de probar todos los sistemas eh, para poder llegar hasta la Estación Espacial Internacional. Entonces, lo que tienen que hacer el día de hoy es simplemente probar eso, despegar, llegar hasta la Estación Espacial Internacional, que será mañana alrededor del mediodía, acoplarse. Después se llevan a cabo toda una serie de procesos para que puedan entrar de manera segura a la Estación Espacial Internacional. Después de esto, se decidirá cuánto tiempo van a estar a bordo de la Estación Espacial. Podrían ser seis o hasta 12 semanas o un poco más. Eh, todo depende de cómo funcione todo el, todos los sistemas. No se quiere arriesgar nada. Esta es una misión de demostración. Todavía no es una misión operativa que tenga eh, tareas en específico como eh, las tareas científicas que siempre tienen los astronautas que van hasta la Estación Espacial Internacional. Ya se hizo la misión de demostración 1 en marzo del año pasado, donde el único tripulante era este pequeño peluche que pues, solamente indicó el momento en el que alcanzaron eh, pues un punto en donde hay gravedad cero y esta es la misión de demostración 2. Una vez que eh, pues lleguen a la estación internacional, a la estación espacial internacional, eh, pues van a poder ahí compartir con los tres tripulantes que están en este momento a bordo de la misión de la expedición 63. Solo uno de ellos es eh, americano, los otros dos son cosmonautas rusos. Chris Cassidy es el el americano y los otros dos son cosmonautas rusos, así que pues es probable que eh, estos dos nuevos astronautas de la NASA pues se queden para ayudar con algunas labores del segmento estadounidense en la Estación Espacial Internacional. Hay un dato muy interesante que es que ambos astronautas están casados con astronautas, así que son familias de astronautas, están eh, casados con el astronauta Karen Nieberg y también con Megan MacArthur, ellas dos pues también han ido al espacio, han ido a la Estación Espacial Internacional, han volado en el transbordador espacial y en la nave Soyuz. Entonces, pues es verdaderamente familias de astronautas, lo cual debe ser muy, muy emocionante también para todos ellos, porque este es un vuelo histórico, es la quinta vez que los Estados Unidos eh, lanza astronautas en una nave completamente nueva. Y si y todo sale bien, pues... Eh, a, Hace muy poco tiempo, el administrador de NASA, Jim Bridenstine, anunció que sería pro probablemente para finales de agosto cuando se llevaría a cabo la primera misión operativa de la Crew Dragon o la Dragon para tripulación. Esta llevaría eh, varios astronautas. Serían Michael Hopkins, Victor Glover, también el japonés Soichi Noguchi y a Shannon Walker, también de la NASA, tres astronautas de la NASA, un astronauta o taikonauta de JAXA, de la Agencia Espacial Japonesa, y esto sucedería el 30 de agosto más o menos, si todo sale conforme a lo planeado. Esta nueva nave eh, puede acomodar hasta siete personas, lo cual es un eh, avance muy grande porque eh, pues la nave Soyuz, que es la nave que han estado utilizando los astronautas para llegar hasta la Estación Espacial Internacional en estos nueve años únicamente, solamente puede acomodar a tres astronautas. Entonces, pues pasarían de tres hasta siete. Y otra noticia muy emocionante e interesante es que, bueno, obviamente se volverían ya periódicos estos viajes de la nave Dragon para tripulación y cada año podrían viajar uno o dos turistas, es decir, personas eh, completamente ajenas al mundo espacial de alguna forma, no, que no hayan tenido que ser seleccionados como astronautas por NASA, sino que pasen otros procesos con compañías eh, privadas, con SpaceX, por supuesto, y entonces pues se abre la posibilidad para que haya más personas como ustedes y como nosotros pudiendo viajar al espacio. Entonces todo esto es muy, muy, muy emocionante. Y pues estamos todos eh, a la expectativa de que en unos minutos todos eh, pues estemos viendo despegar a estos dos astronautas en ruta hacia la Estación Espacial Internacional. 
Así que, pues, espero que tengan todos los detalles que necesitan para poder disfrutar de este despegue. La forma en la que se va a acoplar esta nave, lo cual también es bastante interesante, es completamente automática, es decir, no va a haber ninguna intervención a menos que haya alguna emergencia por parte de los astronautas para poder acoplarse a la Estación Espacial Internacional y esto es una verdadera maravilla de la ingeniería. Y bueno, esta nave tiene muchísimas, eh, muchísimas eh, pues, cosas que se han mejorado a partir de las otras naves. Por ejemplo, tiene un sistema de escape muy, muy eficiente que podría poner a salvo a los astronautas en cualquier momento de la misión, desde el despegue e incluso si están en órbita, tienen la posibilidad de separarse del cohete. Y otro detalle también siempre muy emocionante, desde que siempre es emocionante desde la primera vez que lo logró SpaceX en el 2015, es que la primera etapa del cohete Falcon 9 o Falcon 9 regresa y aterriza y tiene eh, pues programado aterrizar en una pequeña plataforma que se encuentra ahí en medio del océano. Entonces es verdaderamente impresionante ver esta maravilla de la ingeniería, cómo viene desde el cielo este cohete y en un pedacito muy pequeño logra con muchísima precisión recolocarse. Las naves eh, Dragon eh, para tripulación pues, se planea que puedan ser reutilizadas unas cinco veces, lo cual pues hace de esto verdaderamente accesible porque imagínense que tuviéramos que volar en avión y que cada vez que voláramos en avión tuvieran que tirar el avión porque ya no sirve, sería carísimo viajar en avión. Entonces, la meta, obviamente, de Elon Musk y de SpaceX y de muchas otras compañías como Blue Origin es volver a estas naves espaciales reutilizables completamente para que los costos bajen muchísimo. Y, bueno, esto también es importante porque es un paso más del programa Artemisa, el programa que va a llevar a la primera mujer y al siguiente hombre a la luna, esto para el 2024. Hay mucho que se tiene que preparar todavía para ese día, pero eh, pues esto ya le devuelve la capacidad a los Estados Unidos de llevar astronautas al espacio. SpaceX está muy involucrado en este programa Artemisa, así que estamos muy emocionados y estaremos siguiendo todos los pasos de Artemisa hasta que veamos a otra vez a los seres humanos y a la primera mujer caminar sobre la luna en el 2024. I can't hear you, Ron. I think you have to unmute me. Yeah, uh, it, it could help. I tried to be uh, tried to be muted whenever you do that. Thank you so much for coming on today and uh, you know helping us to reach out to our Spanish speaking audience, which uh, we 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 love that they come and they join us for uh, all the different things that we do at the Space Foundation Discovery Center. Uh, space Symposium, and I know we are an emerging space country, and uh, we're excited to see what's next. So thank you for joining us and bringing uh, all the awesome, as you always do. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I hope it was very helpful for all the Spanish-speaking uh, community and that they get excited and interested in knowing more about space. You can awesome. follow me, and we'll keep you updated. Perfect. Thank you so much, Anna, and we will see you. Uh, we will see you soon. We appreciate you joining us. Yeah, thank you. Okay. And uh, next up, everybody, we are going to bring in our friends from the uh, from the Space Report. And we have Leslie Kahn and Becky. And let me see if Matt's camera is on. Matt's camera is on. Okay, perfect. So uh, I'm glad to have all three of you with us today. So uh, the first thing I think we want to do, just to touch on this real quick, is uh, for those that don't know what the Space Report is, Leslie, can you give us just a quick elevator pitch of, uh, of what it is that you all do? Oh, absolutely. And Ron, thank you so much for having us. So the space report um, really has two pillars. Uh, one, we have an online presence uh, at our website, and I think we'll be showing you that site. So uh, we have more than a decade of research and graphics and interactive materials that really just covers all aspects of the space industry, whether it's infrastructure or the global economy or workforce development. And then last year, we switched from an annual publication to a quarterly publication. So at the end of each financial quarter, um, we produce a publication that, again, gives you in-depth analysis on all aspects of the space industry. 
Excellent. Uh, so thank you uh, for giving us just a little bit of background there. And uh, so, Becky, we want to talk to you a little bit. There's a whole lot that's going on today. And, uh, you know, it's it's data and analysis, right? You guys are going to give us a breakdown a little bit about what's happening. So can you talk a little bit about the numbers we've been seeing uh, recently for you know human space flight in 2020 and what's been going on and what you all are up to with the space report? Absolutely. So starting with a quick review, basically, of our history of launching people to the ISS out of both the United States and of Russia. So since that first crewed launch in October of 2000, 18 different countries have sent their astronauts to the ISS. A total of 131 individuals have set foot on the ISS. Of those, about 59 were of US nationality. That's about 45% of all ISS astronauts, which is actually the largest share of any nation. What's unusual about that is that the vast majority, more than 90% of launches, crewed launches to the ISS, have launched out of Baikonur in Russia. So of those USS astronauts, that's 88% that have hitched a ride from Russia to the ISS, which is a total of 59 seats we've used, and some have used multiple seats. And that's to the tune of somewhere between 55 million per seat, that's what the inspector general said, or all the way up to $90.2 million per seat, which is what we most recently paid for a seat in this coming October. So really, the National Commercial Crew Program signals a return to this bygone era, right? In 2001, the U.S. actually conducted all ISS launches, crewed ISS launches. But by 2008, we launched once, and we launched one astronaut in 2008 from U.S. soil. So since the shuttle retired, 2001, the U.S. has lost its autonomous launch capabilities. Nonetheless, the share of astronauts we've had has remained fairly stable. It's somewhere between a quarter and a half of all astronauts hovering around a third most of the time. And so frankly, a successful launch today will ensure continued access to all of those research opportunities that we find on the ISS, and it'll help paint a roadmap for further human space exploration. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Becky, for uh, touching base on that. And uh, Matt, I know you got some things that you're gonna share with us. So uh, you wanna touch, uh, touch base on some of, the, some of the data points that you were able to bring to the table for us today, sir. Sure. Thanks a lot, Ron. Thanks, Becky. Uh, I want to share with you a little bit about SpaceX and their uh, recent achievements. Um, so this week marks eight years since the SpaceX's Dragon capsule became the first commercial spacecraft to attach to the International Space Station. So as of today, the Falcon 9, Block 9, excuse me, has carried 480 payloads to orbit, 75% of which are its own Starlink spacecraft. Making SpaceX now officially the number one operator in orbit is 379 of its own payloads. At the Space Foundation, we've taken a deeper dive into the 2019 payload data for the second quarter of the 2020 space report. We found that SpaceX deployed 75% of all communication satellites in 2019, 120 of the 161 total spacecraft deployed. One of the ways they can put up such large numbers is by manufacturing their own satellites. SpaceX has broken ahead of all other satellite manufacturing currently underway by producing up to six satellites per day which is four times faster than that of their nearest competitor. That effort will likely increase as SpaceX has shared plans to expand the overall size of the Starlink constellation to 42,000 total spacecraft. Although their nearest competitor, OneWeb, has not given up. Due to the COVID-related economic downturn, OneWeb is seeking relief in the U.S. Bankruptcy Court under Chapter 11. However, just this past week, they filed a request for the FCC to launch in total 48,000 satellites. They currently have just 74 in orbit, but once complete, their constellation will have 6,000 more satellites available than SpaceX will. For now, SpaceX's innovative solutions have cemented their place in history as the first company to manufacture, launch, and attach a commercial human spacecraft to the International Space Station. So for that, congratulations, SpaceX. And uh, that's all I have for you, Ron. So back to you. Thank you so much, Matt. And to wrap up, uh, Leslie, I know you're going to give us a few more details and talk a little bit about um, space in Colorado here uh, as we go to, uh, and we're going to follow up that with our next guest from uh, Sierra Nevada Corps. Everybody stick around for that. But Leslie, uh, we'll wrap up with you. Okay. So listen, one of the really great and amazing things about what's happening today is kind of the benchmark that it sets for what's going to come. So the Dragon is expected to attach to the International Space Station on Thursday. And the ISS is now marking their 20th year this year of human occupation. And what they've been doing up there is really just incredible research. We're actually to a point that companies are looking at manufacturing product in space. 
one of the ways that we've gotten there is that a lot of the astronauts, when they are based on the ISS, they conduct research. And just in the last five years, we've seen a 173% increase in the astronaut hours that they are using toward that research. So in 2015, we had 354 hours. By last year, we were up to 967 crew hours. So what will happen as the space flight becomes more common again and we have more commercial partners, we'll begin to see private astronauts going up to the ISS or to other commercial labs. Right now, there are 10 labs that are operating within ISS, but soon we'll see them not only on board ISS, but orbiting around the space station. And those private astronauts will go up there to conduct research. Um, just last June, for example, um, NASA issued a directive that gives NASA, NASA astronauts about 5% more time to conduct purely commercial and marketing research. So it will be the type of work that maybe isn't purely science, but it still puts limitations on them. You're, you're not gonna see them you know, endorsing a candy bar or a sneaker while they're up there. Um, but all of this commercial activity helps drive the global space economy. In 2018, that was estimated at $415 billion. We are taking a look right now at the 2019 data that's available. And in the second quarter edition of the space report, we'll have a detailed analysis that goes over all of that. Um, I think we are all familiar being based in Colorado with um, just what a um, platform the space industry has become for us. Not only is the US Space Force based here now, but we're seeing a lot of private industry come in and develop projects. So kind of another milestone just last month was Sierra Nevada they unveiled the wings of their dream chaser space plane. So really all in all, a lot of incredible, exciting things happening. Oh, Ron, I think- oh, Hold on, there we go, Mike hit the wrong button. <laughs> turn off my camera and turn off, instead of turn on my mic, right? Uh, it's seriously, thank you, uh, the three of you so much for coming on and joining us and sharing what you uh, what you do. And uh, for people that wanna check it out, do make sure to go check out the, the space report and you can find that. I wanna have it scrolling across the bottom here now. So uh, go there, check that out, uh, get all that information. And uh, we're really excited to have both, uh, all three of you on today to talk a little bit about what's going on in the space industry. Uh, thank you so much. And we will see you all very, very soon. Everybody stay safe, okay? Thank you, Thanks, Ron, so much. Great Perfect. work. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, John, we're gonna, gonna welcome you on. John Roth from Sierra Nevada Corporation. We're uh, we're glad to have you on today. And uh, so let's let's talk a little bit about what's happening. Uh, first up, uh, John is the VP of Strategy and Business Development uh, for Space Systems at Sierra Nevada Corporation. Uh, John, how excited are you today for everything that's going on? It is incredibly exciting. I, I tell you, I, if you're a space geek like me and like most of the folks here that work here at Sierra Nevada. Just looking at that rocket with that capsule on the top, getting ready to launch uh, and having people go again from U.S. soil, just uh, an amazing thing. I'm so glad to see it happen. Uh, half of me wishes that was a dream chaser with astronauts on it waiting to launch, and half to me is, is glad that it's not because it'd be so nerve-wracking. <laughs> well, that's perfect to talk about. Uh, you know, we have... Uh... We normally have it hanging in uh, the Space Foundation Discovery Center. We have a dream chaser that uh, you I know that you all normally send around a little bit to do the cons like ISC. We have it at Space Symposium. So uh, I personally love the dream chaser. For people that don't know what it is, can you give us a little bit of background on what it is and what it will do and its, uh, its role in Artemis? Sure. So dream chaser is really what would be the successor to the space shuttle. It's a lifting body vehicle with wings. So it lands on the runway, comes uh, just like the space shuttle does. It glides down from uh, re-entering the atmosphere, comes down to a runway landing. And originally we were working on it under the commercial crew development program. So it was supposed to be a crewed vehicle. Uh, we designed it for crew. Uh, we were gonna carry crew just like uh, Boeing and, and SpaceX will be doing now. Uh, but then when we did not get selected for the crew program, we did a quick shift and we went into the cargo competition and we won one of the contracts for CRS-2, the cargo resupply contract. So now Dream Chaser is going to be used. It's going to go to ISS just like it was planning on uh, originally, but now it's going to be taking cargo initially instead of crew. 
And of course, we hope that in the future we will get back to uh, taking crew ourselves. And uh, so that's not all that uh, Sierra Nevada is up to. You all have, uh, you're going to be working with Dianetics on the, uh, one of the Moonlanders. So I know that's really got to be exciting for you. So can you tell us a little bit about that and what you all are doing? Sure. That was, uh, that was a huge announcement for us. We're on one of the three human landing system contracts, HLS. We're subcontracted to Dianetics, but uh, we're really responsible for the entire uh, crew rating system uh, that's, that's part of the vehicle. We're, our team has done a combined Ascent descent vehicle as, as opposed to having two different vehicles. And so our role is to be the uh, IPT lead for all the human systems that are going inside the vehicle. So it, uh, it gets us back into human systems. We're really excited to be part of that group. And another thing that we're working on obviously is the uh, gateway program and some of the other lunar programs. We're a, a contractor on the commercial lunar payload services or CLIPS program which is going to be running uh, uh, commercial missions to drop things off on the moon. And we're also building a, uh, an inflatable habitat for NASA that could be used for the gateway or it could be used for a lunar surface application or even for transport to Mars. So our company is very engaged, not just in Dream Chaser and low Earth orbit, but in a lot of the Artemis activities that are pushing to the moon and Mars. Uh, you know, that's a really great thing to touch on because it's something we haven't talked about yet today is a lunar gateway. For people that don't know about that, can you touch on that a little bit? And uh, I, I know you just mentioned kind of what you all are working on, but uh, so that way people can be a little bit more informed on that if they're, you know, they're new to the space industry. Yeah, sure. So the gateway is intended to be uh, something that orbits uh, the moon in an orbit very so it's similar to the International Space Station, which is in low Earth orbit for the Earth. But this would be a waypoint for uh, lunar missions. So the idea is instead of just going to the moon and then coming back like we did uh, back in the Apollo days where you do one-off missions, they want to have an orbiting station around the moon that could support missions that go from the surface and back to this gateway. And the gateway could be a, a waypoint for astronauts to wait in between missions. It could be a place where samples are brought back from the surface and could be analyzed and have a scientific capability. So the Gateway is, is a very exciting uh, development that NASA is doing to make sure that we can have a continued presence on the moon and that we can support the moon from a very close distance rather than having to come all the way back and land on Earth and then turn around and go back to the moon. Uh, so, I mean, Sierra Nevada obviously does so much, and we're glad to have him in Colorado. Uh, you know, at the Colorado Space Business Roundup uh, last uh, December, uh, was glad to see uh, you all had a very large presence there talking about everything that's happening. So, uh, you know, maybe we could talk a little bit about the fact that it is based here in Colorado and, uh, you know, the jobs that you all provide and all the amazing things that you get to do here in our, in our great state in the Rocky Mountain Range. <laughs> it, it just, uh, anybody that works in the space industry knows how great Colorado is. You have such a support network. I mean, not only do you have the, uh, the Space Command, of course, but you've got so many companies doing so many incredibly innovative things. Uh, we subcontract as much as we can to other Colorado companies. Obviously, we're using ULA, United Launch Alliance, for our launch vehicle for Dream Chaser missions. So we're going to be on the Vulcan launch vehicle for that. But we subcontract to literally dozens of small businesses in Colorado, uh, we team with the larger companies in Colorado. We work with Ball. We work with uh, ULA. We work with Lockheed Martin, uh, just about everybody that's here. We have a, a great relationship, even when we compete with other companies. We're all part of the Colorado ecosystem. We all love Colorado, and, and we all love supporting the industry here. And I think that's something that's important for people uh, to hear, too, is that uh, you know, there's so many businesses, there's so many different things out there that when it comes to this, we're going to see uh, it's more a, of a competition. And you, you are certainly in competition, but everybody here works together. You see a panel of people that all work for different organizations like, oh, yeah, we're working with that person on this thing. And everybody on there is connected in some way. And it takes everybody to get the space. Yeah. And uh, I'm really, really glad that we were able to have you on to talk about it today. So where can people find out more about what Sierra Nevada is up to in the future? Um, and I, I've got the website below. It's on the, uh, the, the stream there. You can see it. Um, uh, but any other details you might want to get out to people? Yeah, the, the, if you check out the website, we have links to all our social media uh, locations. And we love to do updates. We're doing updates all the time. We let our employees take over uh, social media and talk about what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we show pictures of what's going on with Dream Chaser. We just had the wings delivered a few weeks ago. We had the uh, Shooting Star cargo module delivered, the, the flight version, which is really great. So now the entire vehicle is being integrated. It's coming together and we're trying to use social media to keep everybody up to date. So, uh, so please follow us. Thanks.
And uh, for somebody that uh, is the social media consultant for the Space Foundation, I appreciate that you all uh, do that. And it's really fun. I've seen it before where uh, different members will take over uh, the social media and go out there and kind of show what a day in the life is like. And that's a really funny, a really fun way to highlight the people that work with you. And uh, we're going to be talking a little bit later with some people from our new gen team. We always love seeing those faces, the 18 to 35 faces at Space Symposium and being involved. So, John, thank you so much for coming on today. We'll definitely be doing uh, more talks in the future with uh, with Sierra Nevada about what you all are up to. And maybe we can uh, come out and make a visit and do some stuff and see a little bit behind the scenes with Dream Chaser. <laughs> All right, excellent. Thanks, Ron. All right. Thank you so much, John. And uh, Rich, how's it going? We're going to talk about something here real quick as we bring on, uh, we're getting ready to bring on Paul Lockhart, who uh, is, is incredible here in just a few minutes. But the first thing we want to talk about is, uh, you know, we just found out some new details. Rich, what's going on with, uh, with what's happening there? Well, they are getting ready to load propellant. They have done a, uh, they've done a call around the horn. Everything is go flight. Looks like things are uh, progressing. Weather, of course, people are a little bit concerned. They want to make sure that they've got a green from the weather watch team. Uh, so they're taking a look at some clouds and some other energy that's out there to make sure that, again, everything goes off as perfectly as we want it to be. Um, they're doing all the things that you would be expecting of an absolutely first class launch team. Uh, all the things that the, uh, the, the, the rules that the Gene Kranz and, and others uh, set a long time ago, you have a new generation of talent that are taking those rules, applying them to new rules and applying new rules and technology to, uh, to all the operations. And it's been pretty fascinating to watch that those men and women uh, literally take the mantle of literally Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Skylab, shuttle, station, and take it to the next level. So this is a, you're seeing a whole new generation of space pioneers uh, grabbing that mantle, running with it, and getting ready to write their own set of uh, uh, words in the uh, great story of, in the great story of our adventure in space. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting it's, sound there. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so, yeah, um, we're live without a net. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that happens from time to time. It looks like we had just uh, a little bit of a change up here uh, on uh, something. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and show this amazing video that Shelly uh, Brunswick uh, put uh, put together for us. And we're going to, uh, it's going to talk a little bit about CI and E. It's going to run about eight minutes long. So that way we're going to be able to kind of uh, show you this and highlight what's coming up in the very near future for this. So. Okay. Hey, Ron, yes, before you run that video, uh, Absolutely. Again, this is as, as uh, it, this is uh, our launch. This is uh, mm -hmm. our launch moment that uh, what Shelley Brunswick and uh, the entire team of the Space Foundation have put together. The Center for Innovation and Education is our effort to bring in more people to draw to bring more people into the space community. We're going to be driving workforce development and economic opportunity. So as you hear the brief that Shelley is offering, uh, I'm going to ask that you, the audience, take a look at and, and reflect on this. What's the role that you want to play in the space community? We in the Space Foundation want to help you find that opportunity. Uh, we have a phenomenal network that reaches around the globe, uh, reaches across industry and infrastructure. So again, we're looking for sponsors. We're looking for partners. We're looking for people that want to work with us and make and drive more workforce development and economic opportunity. So uh, Ron, thanks for uh, allowing us to share this brief from Shelly and uh, appreciate it. Absolutely. So we're going to go to this and uh, so that way everybody can hear this. We're going to we're going to mute ours and show everybody kind of what's going on with CINE. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Space Foundation. It's my privilege to introduce you to the Center for Innovation and Education. Space, once considered the final frontier and only accessible to a select few, is now home to the most dynamic and innovative economy on the planet. We at the Space Foundation believe every citizen, community, and country are connected to space in some way. And with a growing global space economy, the need for prepared and engaged talent is paramount. Our mission is to inspire, educate, connect, and advocate on behalf of the global space community. Our three core pillars are space education, space awareness, and service to the space community. Every facet of daily life relies on space technology and innovation. The space economy is growing from $415 billion to $1 to $3 trillion by 2040. And the space business is dominated by commercial companies. 
Commercial industries make up 80% of the U.S. space economy, with government making up the remaining 20%. Now that the space economy is no longer dependent on government agencies as its sole source of funding and development, or limited to a select group of highly skilled scientists and engineers, opportunities are now accessible to all people, from machinists, manufacturers, artists, and entrepreneurs, to engineers and rocket scientists. And the median base salary for a space job is 40% above the median household income in the United States. Beyond those salaries are thousands of space patents waiting for entrepreneurs to commercialize and create the next great product or service. Opportunities in the space economy span virtually every industry that serves daily life on Earth, health and medicine, transportation, public safety, consumer goods, industrial productivity, information technology, financial services, energy, agriculture, the environment, and more. This slide illustrates some of the emerging technologies related to the growing space economy. For a full listing of available NASA patents, go to the NASA Technology Transfer Office for more details. Opportunities abound, however it's complicated. Beyond the abundance of possibilities presented by collaboration between government agencies, such as NASA and the Pentagon, public organizations and private enterprises, the space industry faces a severe workforce shortage, as well as a significant skills deficit. These factors are expected to contribute to a space technology innovation gap. Without the right human capital, laborers to entrepreneurs to STEM experts, and continual career upskilling, to enable the commercialization of space technology innovations, the full potential of the space economy will not be realized. As a global steward and convener of the world space community, the Space Foundation is introducing the Center for Innovation and Education to create and deliver inclusive, innovative and sustainable workforce development and economic opportunity programs that enable all people, students through professionals, to actively participate in the space economy. This initiative, a hub for workforce development and economic opportunity, has been in the works for a couple of years, but the need has never been greater given the millions of jobless citizens and homebound students seeking light at the end of the pandemic tunnel. The space industry has remained one of the most resilient business sectors throughout the COVID-19 crisis and is primed to be a leader in the global recovery. As a 501c3 global leader in space advocacy for nearly four decades, the Space Foundation unites and facilitates collaboration across the entire spectrum of stakeholders from the global space community, business, government, military, education, research, and local stakeholders. Our Center for Innovation and Education brings all of these constituencies together through corporate memberships, partnerships, sponsorships, fundraising, and grants to serve the entire life cycle of the workforce, students, young leaders, entrepreneurs, and professionals for the health and prosperity of the global economy. The Space Foundation, more than any other organization, is uniquely poised and positioned to bring all of these parties together to drive workforce development and economic opportunity. Through public and private partnerships, the center engages students, young leaders, entrepreneurs, and professionals. An example of government partnerships is our Space Commerce Entrepreneurship Program. Examples of some of our commercial partnerships are the New Generation Leadership Program, Junior Space Entrepreneurship Program, and major exhibits at our Space Foundation Discovery Center. We have partnered with universities and colleges across the country, including Youngstown State University, USC, Houston Community College, Embry-Riddle, Howard, Rankin, and more. The Center for Innovation and Education details initiatives for building a professional workforce of today as well as the next generation workforce of tomorrow. The roadmap follows five core disciplines designed to combat the obstacles standing in the way of building a qualified space workforce. Awareness, 
Now is the time to become aware of the abundance of opportunities for everyone to join the space economy workforce and contribute to bettering life on Earth in a meaningful way. Access. Diversity is key to democratizing the workforce and spurring innovation and entrepreneurship. Train. Virtual and remote education, upskilling and reskilling of displaced workers and students will advance more rapidly and will be essential to workforce preparation, growth, and sustainability. Connect, relying on new ways to connect, communicate, and collaborate through a vast network of people and resources will stimulate new ideas for jobs, careers, and business ventures. And mentor. During this period of uncertainty and displacement, experienced space and industry role models must rise up to play a vital role in mentoring, guiding, and grooming the next generation of role models. At the Center for Innovation and Education, we are building today's professional workforce and the next generation workforce. You are at the center of our constellation of opportunity. As you look outward, you select the audience you are trying to reach. Is it students, teachers, entrepreneurs, or young leaders and professionals? You then select the impact or outcome you would like to achieve. Is it networking events, global research, career upskilling, or immersive experiences? Lastly, we work with you to craft a collaborative program that meets your goals and objectives. Again, the space ecosystem includes a diverse array of sectors and industries. Space has never been more important. It unites and inspires people around the globe, and the Center for Innovation and Education is committed to helping people find their place in the space economy. The time is now. Please join us. You can go to our website and become a partner, champion, corporate member, or supporter. With your involvement, who knows the access and opportunities we might create together and we can find those possibilities for everyone. Thank you. Hey Ron, your, your mic is not on. Oh, that could probably that could be very very helpful. I'll say <laughs> yeah, I'll no to make sure that way I you know don't yeah. mess anything up and then I do it anyway. Paul, how's it going, sir? We have Colonel Paul Lockhart in the house with us today to talk a little bit about all the amazing things that are happening. So, uh, you know, a retired uh, NASA astronaut. We just want to pick your brain a little bit about all the things that that uh, are going on today. Hey, Ron, good to speak with you today, and I'm glad we got that communication check done and out of the way. <laughs> yeah, we're, well, we're glad to have you. So what we're going to do is we're going to touch base on uh, just a little bit about what's happening. And so can you share with us a bit about what the astronauts have had to do today to prepare for this launch? Sure. So in a way, I kind of think of it as what haven't they had not to do, because uh, when it comes down to launch day, uh, you've got all of the training out of the way. You've got all of the, the little miscellaneous things that have to be done to make sure the suits fit and everything. So when it comes down to launch day, everything is kind of driven down to the bare necessity to make sure that the launch goes off on time. So um, they've had to uh, basically do the things that get them ready for launch. So wake up, you know, get suited, get that weather brief, make sure the, that they're all ready to go, get taken out to the launch site, get uh, you know, placed into the crew vehicle and so forth like that, and, and then go through the launch countdown. There's nothing else that they need to focus on, so their life is just scoped down to that which is necessary for the launch. And uh, so, obviously, that what we're seeing today is going to be a little different than uh, this, the suit that, that we're in today is a little different than yours. But uh, let's talk a little bit about that. What was your experience like, you know, putting that suit on and just I know you had to feel uh, you know, such an incredible emotion that so few people, only hundreds, have ever felt in their in their lifetime. So well, can you talk a little bit about that, the, the yeah. suit experience. Yeah, I can, Ron. Uh, the suits are totally different. Ours was a pressure suit, and so it had to operate in areas where um, there was uh, reduced atmospheric pressure and protect us if that was the case. And so we had to kind of go through a check of that whole system while we we're in what is called the suit up room. I don't think that's the case. I think that uh, in this Dragon vehicle that that's the pressurized vehicle and so the space suit is to protect them and aid them in interacting with the vehicle. Um, so I'm sure the checks were a lot different for them, but it doesn't really matter how complex the suit checks are and everything. Uh, when you go into that room to get suited up with all the suit techs, your mind is swirling 100 miles a minute and you're trying to make sure that 
you do things right. You're watching everything um, and everybody else doing all their checks to make sure that you're ready to go. And uh, you're just really excited and pumped to go. And I know that they left that room with their hearts pumping and, you know, to head on out to the vehicle to go fly. And uh, so uh, obviously this is just an incredible experience for everyone. How do you feel today? It's been a while since uh, we've launched and you were part of the shuttle program. So you were, you were there and I know it's yeah. been you know, almost, uh, almost 10 years since it happened. So can you talk to us a little bit about uh, how it feels to you to see this happen again? Oh, I'm, I'm having deja vu because uh, the last time I think that America was in this position was when I was in graduate school and the space shuttle launched on its first mission. And uh, I watched it uh, from afar also while I was at college. And so it kind of gave me the same feelings. In other words, here's America right on the precipice of trying something new. We don't really know what the outcome will be, but we know that everybody is ready to go. Uh, and so uh, it still has that, that feeling of excitement and adventure tinged with a little bit of the, uh, you know, the risk that everybody know it, that everybody knows is out there. But underpinning all of that is the knowledge that everybody has done all the best they can do to get ready, that the crew is trained, that the, the mission support people have done all they can do, that mission control is ready for them to go. Uh, and so it basically just all envelops and wraps together in one big uh, heart-pumping excitement for everyone that's uh, involved in nation space program. And it's not just the people at NASA or that are part of uh, – uh, you know, this one mission, it's our nation as a whole. And I think that's what's got everybody excited to to include me, of course. And, uh, you know, so one of the things that uh, we want to do a quick thank you to you for is the fact that you do work with us at, with the formal education team at Space Foundation, going out and speaking to, to kids and inspiring them. And it's always incredible what you do with that. So can you tell us a little bit about your, your role with that um, and, and what you've done with us? And uh, what does it mean to you to inspire the next generation of, of astronauts and scientists and artists and uh, everything that you do? Uh, thanks, Ron. So I'm very fortunate to be connected back uh, with the Space Foundation because they give me a conduit uh, to officially go and speak before thousands of uh, school-aged children and young adults across the United States. And I would think, or I, I know if somebody sat and asked me what are some of the most memorable things that had happened to me since I left NASA many years ago, I would say it's those times where I get to speak in front of our nation's future explorers and our future doctors and lawyers and teachers and and just citizens and tell them that uh, you know that the path previous to them was uh, filled with uh, good people and that they are going to step up and be the next explorers for you know for the United States and America. So for me to take part of that has been uh, you know you know just kind of gives me the feeling like okay I've been able to get back and do what people did for me when I was young. And, uh, you know, just to wrap up before we go to the, the sure. screen for, for the launch is that let's talk a little bit about, you know, your, your new venture. Uh, you're working on uh, Virtus. Hopefully I said that right. Uh, Adventures. And so what's the mission with that? And, and what are you all doing uh, to kind of share, I think, probably your experiences uh, with the world? OK, Ron. So uh, you and the Space Foundation are the, the start of all of this. So as I said, it, it's been such an honor and a pleasure to kind of give back to the youth of America that I thought, well, Hey, how can I combine that with what used to to uh, interest and make me excited when I was young? And that's the adventure stories I read when when I was little. And those started out being very simple adventure stories, and then they became complex ones, and then eventually they became biographies of some of America's heroes, to including the early astronauts and so forth. So I thought that I would sit there and try and find a way to reach out to the youth of America. And I thought, hey, why don't I try and write a book with some of these? And so I created a website called Virtus Adventures. Virtus is from the Latin word, which means courage and excellence and, and doing the right things. And uh, I'm slowly reaching out to the youth of America and uh, interfacing with them on Facebook. And, and I appreciate um, the Space Foundation and what you all have done. And my goal is to... Uh, have a cadre of my good peers and friends that we talk about adventures that we can do near our homes and afar and with our friends, especially in this time of the pandemic, and uh, eventually, hopefully, find a few of those that would like to help me write a book about adventure and so we can do it as a collaborative effort. So we'll see how this turns out. 
Awesome. Uh, Paul, we can't thank you enough for joining us today. So we just got the news that the launch is scrubbed. Um, so we're going <laughs> to hop over to that live stream uh, just to see a little bit of the details that, that NASA has for us. But uh, we were so right. glad to have you on to, to talk about all the things you're doing. And we do want to remind everybody we are going to continue to, to do the live stream. We've got a lot of amazing guests that are going to come up uh, later, just like the Lieutenant Governor, uh, Diane Pr Primavera. She's going to be on, Emily Calandrelli, uh, Dr. Tanya Harrison. We've got a, a lot of great guests. But uh, Paul, thank you for that behind behind the scenes uh, look at what the astronauts experience today. And uh, we appreciate you coming on and joining us. Uh, you're quite welcome. Thanks, Ron. And I appreciate it to all my friends at the Space Foundation. Good luck. And, and we'll launch again here very soon. Yes, sir. Thank okay, you, so let's hop over to that live stream and just kind of look and see what's going on um, and, and get some details on uh, what happened here. Informed uh, Bob and Doug. They said we gave it a good try, what they understand. And uh, we are here to try another day. So right now we did uh, officially hold the clock. It looks like a T minus 16 minutes, 54 seconds. The launch automatic sequence that controls the Falcon 9, the loading of propellants, the cycling of valves, that is also stopped. We now proceed into what is a normal scrub sequence for us. We practice this every launch. So now we move into safely taking the propellants, the pressurization gases back off the first and second stages. As things get into a safe configuration, then we will uh, disarm the escape system on Dragon, and we'll bring the crew access arm back around the uh, spacecraft. So right now, we got down to just inside 17 minutes. The hardware was working very well on both Dragon and spacecraft. We had the uh, fuel loading going on. We had liquid oxygen loading going on, everything but second stage. And the weather just needed a little bit more time to clear the conditions. We didn't have that time because we had an instantaneous window. And so with that, SpaceX launch director had to call upon the input from okay, weather. Dragon, had to call the the scrub for the day for the safety rules that we have for this flight. So right now the team is undergoing the uh, post scrub operations on both Dragon uh, as well as Falcon 9, working with the range. No issues being reported right now as we start to go through that sequence. Everything looks good. And uh, Dan, uh, we, had a, we had a good uh, webcast going here until the very end. So, uh, you know, we'll look at it as uh, now we've had another great uh, dry rehearsal. Last Saturday we did a dry one, I should say, and today we've done a wet dress rehearsal. But sorry, we just couldn't get there, Dan. Yeah, thanks, John. I and obviously we can't control the weather. We came right down to the wire there, hoping we could just squeeze in between those cloud systems, get a launch today, but it wasn't to be. Um, but it doesn't mean this we're done. We're going to have another attempt coming up in just three days. So we're going to be doing this all over again, essentially on Saturday uh, on the 30th. And that launch attempt is going to be coming at 3.22 p.m. Eastern time. So a little bit earlier in the day. It's going to look largely the same to everything that we saw today with the crew waking up, going through suit up, making their way to the pad. So it's going to, we're going to feel a lot of deja vu, I think, on Saturday. Yep. Um, but still exciting. Um, safety is always first. So if weather was not there for us today, hopefully Saturday it will be there for us and we will have a safe launch on Saturday. Yeah, the initial weather report still had us at about, I think, a 40% uh, possibility of violation. So weather a little bit better, but we're still going to be kind of rolling the dice. It is Florida in the spring and summer, so storms are always a possibility. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, one of the good things, though, the vehicle appeared to be in great health throughout the day, both Dragon and Falcon 9, so we didn't have to scrub for any technical issue. We're going to continue and follow along with Bob and Doug until they're out of that capsule. As again, they had started loading fuel onto the Falcon 9 rocket. So they'll have to wait until all that fuel comes off. They'll disarm the launch escape system, which still stays armed because they're still sitting on a partially loaded rocket. And then once they're able to disarm that launch escape system, the crew arm will swing back out. They'll make their way once again back the way they came. And then we'll be back to crew quarters for Bob and Doug for a few more days. All right, so it looks like we got uh, we got a scrub, and that's always uh, that's always painful to to see. Uh, so, Paul, you stuck around with us, so I really appreciate this. So, let's pick your brain 
uh, a little bit. Um, let us know, you know, have you ever been a part of a scrub and what that might be like? Uh, and it's as it does uh, uh, as heartbreaking as we think it might be. <laughs> so we or I am three for three now, if you include today's scrub. So both of my missions uh, uh, entailed two week scrubs, one for weather, just like today and, and another one for uh, uh, a mechanical reason. So, yeah, it is heartbreaking because you know, launch day is a little different, actually, from the days where you do your um, mock-ups and your simulations and your, your dry runs. And so when you really go into launch, yeah, you're really pushing with all that you have in order to get this vehicle off the ground. Not even as much for yourself, but for the whole NASA team in America when you want to do this. So to all of a sudden have that come to a halt, it, uh, you know, it's really kind of grabs you by the you know, by the insides and your heart and everything and says, oh, gosh, we're so close. I just wanted to get this off and do it right. But you always know that uh, everybody will be there and you'll come back in a few days and, and try again. And uh, so, you know, what's what's next for the astronauts now? So uh, obviously they're, they're there, they're waiting. And there's a lot that goes into this. It's not like they just hopped in that spacecraft. They've been there waiting for some time now. So what's next for them? So they'll have to extract themselves. They'll have uh, the, um, you know, the crew personnel that will help them get out of the vehicle and uh, get them back down onto the ground. And then they'll go back over to crew quarters. And actually, it'll be kind of a mental down day because they've had to go through the intense you know, wake up and then suit up and then walk, go out to the launch vehicle and strap in and then go through all the tests and then the emotional no-go. And so they'll spend today uh, basically just kind of taking a mental back step from, from all of the activity. Uh, tomorrow, they might have a few briefings or a few um, reviews of how the actual process went to see if there's some things they need to change. But uh, over the next couple of days, I expect what they'll do is start looking at the weather more closely uh, to see if they think that Saturday is a really a good day for, for launch or whether it'll actually present some more problems and whether the actual follow on will be, you know, next week or something. But for today, it's, um, it's a mental break day for them after today's intense activities. Um, so, Rich, I'm sure that you've been in a launch before that's been scrubbed. Uh, how do you think the people are there feeling right now? You know, it's like there's so many people that traveled down there. Some of them shouldn't have. <clears throat> uh, but, you know, <laughs> uh, you know we've, got, we've got a lot going on. And, uh, you know, so really uh, th this I know can be a little heartbreaking. Um, so what's it like? You know, what do you think? What are you feeling? And uh, should we try and get down there maybe Saturday? I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, it's probably a faster road trip for me than it is for you, Ron, from Colorado. Uh, I had been down there and had uh, launches scrubbed. I have been there and had uh, main engines fire up and then have them cut off um, mm. because something was wrong. And, uh, you know, the thing that you always sort of hear the people who don't know the machine or really aren't. Uh, as attuned to what's going on with the entire operation. Well, can't they just relight it? Uh, no, it doesn't work that way. And, uh, you know, again, there is a lot of energy and anticipation that's down there. And as people are listening to, uh, whether it's the, the feed on their phones or it's the loudspeakers that may be in the surrounding area, you know, again, uh, people who live along Space Coast uh, have seen their share of launches and seen their share of scrubs, but uh, everybody wants this to go right. Everybody wants this to go safely. Uh, nobody wants a bad day in space at all. And uh, the point that uh, I think it is a, a confidence builder, I think, not only to the team, but for the crew, but I think it's also for the public that, again, we're not going to rush this. We're going to do this right. And uh, we had a weather system that was off the coast. Nothing we can do about that. Uh, obviously, in Flor Florida, like Colorado, uh, you know, it has weather that will change in an instant. And uh, you've got to deal with that. But you have a number of people who are looking at all the different pieces associated with the with the mission. You're looking at the weather. You're looking at the engineering. You're looking at software. You're looking at all of those things. You have a team of teams that are coming together to make this work. And so you had a team member that leaned forward and said, no, we're not no go. Uh, whatever they're they're. Uh, you know, phrase du jour may be, but this was not a go flight from that team member. And as such, uh, the operation brings it to a halt uh, until everybody says go, no one's going. And uh, that's the right call. Uh, SpaceX, it's not a call that anybody wanted to make, but it was the right call. 
And when you take a look at the weather radar maps, as I pulled up here on my computer here a couple of seconds ago, yeah, you got a lot of energy that's out there. Uh, God forbid that the, we would have a mission aboard. Uh, no one wants to have anything like that occur. But we have had our share of rockets that have been struck by lightning on their way up. Uh, the Apollo 12 uh, mission was almost scrubbed uh, as literally it was struck by lightning as it was uh, lifting off and as its mission started. And by a, uh, you know, a, a, a quick flip of the switch by Alan Bean was what saved that mission. And again, we've got a great crew that is trained and ready to do what they need to do. Um, but tough call, right call. Agreed. So, okay, let's uh, let's go back to you, Paul, if, if we can. Thank you for sticking on with us for a little bit here. Um, say that everything went right and they launched. What Can you tell us a little bit about the experience they would be feeling right now, just to be in that seat and rocketing towards space and knowing that for, I mean, th th there's the first time, and I know that I believe uh, for both of them they've actually launched before, but the first time knowing that you were minutes away from seeing, you know, the Earth from space uh, for the first time. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like? Sure. The, the entire launch day, I thought, almost became a little bit surreal on your first launch. And that's because you practice so many times that when it's the real thing, uh, it's uh, surprising to see the countdown clock continue to go down and know, oh, within two minutes or 30 seconds, I'm actually going to be lifting off. So, but when it happens, you almost snap back out of that dreamy state that, uh, that you've been in as the whole process comes down to this launch point and you're snapped right back into your training. So you immediately start going through your checklist and everything. So for them, I know that those two experienced crew members, uh, Doug and Bob, would have been immediately thinking of their processes and procedures. Where are they on the ascent? In other words, have they cleared the launch tower and are they on the right trajectory and are the engines operating properly? And they're listening to uh, the mission, you know, the launch director tell them, uh, what's the status of their, their vehicle according to the uh, systems on the ground as they monitor everything. So everything would have been focused on that. When you start going through your missions where you've flown a couple of times, uh, I think it becomes a little bit more, um, in a sense, uh, uh, normal. In other words, time doesn't distort itself too much and you can start to understand what's happening, which is what happened on my second flight when I was able to absorb more of what was happening around me. So I actually saw the launch tower pass by me uh, and still do my job. Uh, and it's on that uh, second mission. And then also at the end of my first launch, when I actually was able to um, stop thinking about the intense vibrations that were in the vehicle. And at a proper time when everything was safe, I could look out the windows and I had my first aha moment in, in flight, which is, uh, uh, I saw the blackness of space, and as the space shuttle rolled from a, a heads down to a heads up attitude, uh, I could look out uh, my pilot's window, and, and I saw the black of space, and then eventually, as we rolled to that heads up attitude, this beautiful blue sphere rolled into view, and, and I knew that was the Earth, and that was my first perspective of space, or of the Earth from space, and so that really stayed with me. But for this crew member, or these crew members, I know they would have been really focused on um, on getting the job done right since it was a, a test flight and that all of the eyes of uh, NASA and the world, well, and America and the world were on them, you know, to execute their job properly. I love it. So, uh, you know, I think that we've got some some other big things that are coming up here soon. We're going to see commercial space flight for the first time. So, Rich, if you got the chance, would you get on a, a Virgin Galactic launch or would you get on a... Absolutely. Uh... <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So you've been I, waiting I, for a long time. I, I would need, I'd, I'd need a bigger suit than the other guys, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, where I am taking up more space, tragically. Um, but, you know, Paul, if we still got you there, I've got to ask you a question. Obviously, you know, uh, the, the mission control team, the flight readiness team, they're scheduling everything that you do at every instant. But do you ever just have just sort of a brief moment to yourself that you look at your crewmates and say, wow, guys, we're really going to do this? Actually, there's a lot of time uh, just before launch, as, I, as everybody asks many times, well, what are you doing before launch? And different from when you do simulations and from when you do the countdown test before launch and you're, you're doing the dry runs where you're actually practicing emergency procedures and doing the what ifs if this happened or what if this happened, how would you handle it? On actual launch day, uh, you, you have almost less to do 
And I want to make sure I still have you all there. Good. Uh, you actually sometimes have less to do because you know that mission control is really filling in that void there. And you do have a few moments to sit back and reflect on where you are. I recall distinctly uh, during the lulls between when they were uh, going through the checklist for the launch of the space shuttle, being able to look out my window and, and I could see the clouds forming out there, the black clouds that eventually caused us to scrub our launch. But seeing the seagulls fly by and, and seeing how serene and quiet it was out there at the time, but yet knowing within a few hours we would be launching through uh, the same atmosphere. So you do have time to look over at your crewmates and kind of give each other a thumbs up and do a little bantering on the radios and so forth and talk to the, to the launch director and thank them for everything that they've done. So it, it is kind of a reflective time up until that vehicle comes alive. And for the space shuttle, that was about six minutes before launch when you turn on the auxiliary power units. For this vehicle, I'm not sure when that is, but I'm sure at some point the crew is all, you know, is really directed into focusing on the vehicle and making sure that everything's ready for go for launch. And when that happens, their brain changes over to go, okay, it's it's go time, folks. And uh, and then you change. So do does anybody bring a small boom box in on that time? That you <laughs> in particular, you know, uh, you know, does the commander get to pick what music selection goes on first, sort of like the parent controlling the car radio a little bit there? You know, again, um, I, I'm sure, sure there's a little bit of banter that goes on there. Oh, there is. Uh, there's no boom box, of course, but you may have somebody break into, a, into a, a little karaoke or sing a song or something. And in Yuri's head, for us in the shuttle at least, you had a little banter going on between those on the mid deck and then those that were on the flight deck. There'd be four on the flight deck and three on the mid deck. And you would ask them how they're doing down there and vice versa. And they'd say, hey, what's going on? What can you see out the window and things of that nature? And then there's banter back and forth with uh, the individual members of the uh, the vehicle on the flight deck and so forth. And a lot of it is, uh, uh, you know, a lot of it focuses back on the training that you've done for an entire year. You've spent a long time with these people. And I know, um, Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin have spent a long time training for this, along with all the SpaceX personnel and the NASA personnel. So I'm sure over that entire time period, there's been some funny things that would happen. And so as they get to some point in the countdown, one might turn to the other if everything is going quietly and say, hey, do you recall during this simulation when this happened and how we responded and so forth? So that's the good way to release the tension that occurs and that builds up. So. Uh, Maybe no boom box, but there might be a little singing that goes on if somebody's got the voice. Yeah, I'm sure that the uh, you know the the uh, iPhones are sort of t tucked away so that that's not a distraction <laughs> for anybody there. But right. and it, it has to be an amazing uh, feeling again uh, to to have been a part of a crew uh, like that as you have been. But then again, the work that you're doing today to help us inspire that next generation of explorer and entrepreneur is tremendous. We at the Space Foundation. Uh, are incredibly honored, humbled, and blessed by uh, your presence as a partner of ours. We're grateful for everything that you do, and uh, we're thrilled to have you as part of our network of uh, literally a global network of people that makes a difference around the world. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we're excited to have you here, and uh, as we look to do future Launch Day Lives, uh, we'll be calling on you again. But uh, again, thank you for being a part of uh, today's program. Yeah, you're quite welcome, Rich. And Ron, thank you also. Uh, you got a great smile there and you got everybody excited, Ron. So I appreciate you letting me be a part of today. Thank you so much, sir. We're, we're glad to have you and always appreciative of all the amazing things that you do for us. All right. Yeah, well, everybody take good care. We'll see you soon. Bye, Paul. All right. Bye now. So everybody, as you uh, may know, we are going to continue on with the show. Uh, we've actually got all of our biggest guests coming up. The Lieutenant Governor is going to be on in a little while. Can't wait to talk today on Primavera about everything that's going on with space in our state. We have Emily Calandrelli. She's going to come on and talk to us a little bit about her role as a science communicator and all the incredible things that she does. And of course, the first mission to the moon where the first woman will uh, step foot on the moon is going to be incredible. So Rich, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the things that are coming up. We're going to talk about it just a little bit later, but Perseverance, the, the next mission to Mars is coming up here in the very near future too we're definitely going to do a launch day live for that uh it may be moved back we're not entirely sure yet with everything that's going on with the coronavirus what are you going to do um but i think this is a really exciting time we had uh at one point we were going to have four missions to mars this year uh that you know there's just so much happening in the space era you know space is back and i love that and i know you got to too
space has always been there and, it, and you know people talk about space being back space space has been there space is going to continue to be there what i think is great is the new energy and the new people the new voices that we see being a part of this uh you know i perseverance was starting the the packing up process to go through some of its shakeout tests and again uh those go well you know again we're looking at a july launch on something like that and and that mars team and again, when you take a look at everything that we have done from the Viking lander in 1976 all the way up to uh, Mars Insight, if you take a look at the footage that we are getting from Mars and the knowledge that, we're, that we get from each one of those missions, holy cow. I mean, it, every, every step is bigger and bolder and more impactful. And this is where, again, uh, there's, a, I think, the most powerful four-letter word. And I know people are like, oh, my God, what's the man going to say? The most powerful four-letter word in space today is data. And there is a whole new class of data scientists that are literally coming to light uh, in, in the use and literally taking some of the old data from literally the Viking program, the Voyager program, Pioneer program, and looking at it with some of the new tools. We're making discoveries out of old data that we didn't realize before. But now we also have all of these new capacities that are coming about. And NASA and its international partners, particularly on some of the on the international missions like what Japan has done and what ESA, uh, European Space Agency have done. These agencies in many ways make the data available to the public because they recognize, look, there's someone out there who might see something that I don't. And they may be able to make a discovery that I've missed. And that's one of the things that is so empowering about space today. And for the data community, in particular the data community, they can come in and with, with algorithms, with other instruments, and with their own knowledge, being able to extrapolate some things we haven't seen before. And that's really exciting because all of those discoveries fuel the next step that we make. Perseverance is a great, is a tremendous step of what we're going to do. And the Mars Insight uh, program and what it has done with small sats, particularly orbiting Mars, has, again, given us leaps and bounds in capacity of what we, what we could have only imagined in science fiction. Well, science fiction is becoming science reality today. And that's happening on Mars. That is literally happening as we're planning to go back to the moon. And, and certainly with what's happening on space station. I can't believe it's been 20 years that we've been living on board this uh, instrument, but the space station is the greatest engineering achievement of humanity. And I don't say that lightly, but when you bring people from around the world that build something and build something cooperatively and share in that research, share in that knowledge, share in that experience, boy, you have an awful lot of value that's created by that. And that's where, again, space is a tremendous value added asset for everybody. And every nation that has had a visitor or a longer term inhabitant on board the International Space Station is an owner in that. But all of the partner nations have made sure that the people of Earth are owners of that process as well. Which is why, again, when we look at these Mars missions, that what are planned by NASA and what are being planned by other countries, boy, there's a lot to be excited about. And yeah, I mean, I think it's a really exciting time. I, I love what we've got going on right now and everything. It, you know, again, you know, space is back and it, it's it's the biggest thing in the world. Um, private industry has become such a huge part of what's happening now. Did you ever think that you would see a time in your life where, you know, it was, you know, SpaceX, uh, a SpaceX or a Virgin Galactic or something like that would, would come into come into play and start taking people on commercial space flights? I, I can boldly and proudly say yes on that. Um, when I started my career as a NASA contractor, the first job that I had for my boss then at NASA was literally writing a report about the commercial development of space. And uh, that was, I started at work in the summer of 1990 uh, in what was then the Office of Commercial Programs at NASA headquarters. And uh, we did have people who thought a lot about um, where this could go and that vendors like a Elon Musk or a ULA, as well as the Boeings and Lockheeds and others that we, the institutional companies that have been there and have pioneered and done tremendous work. You know, we did see something like this. And again, today is about capacity building. And if we can allow NASA to do some of the other challenges that industry is not able to take on, then let's let NASA do that. 
But when industry can provide the service, as NASA has dictated its requirements, and certainly there are government agencies that go about doing all the safety measures and the licensing and approving of launches, that's great. But when industry can go ahead and provide those services, they should be able to provide those services. If you look at the revolution of what has occurred in geospatial technology, uh, that has largely been driven by industry because once government got uh, put its requirements out and allowed industry to jump into the jump into respond to those things, you have things like Google Earth. You have all of the respective GPS tools that we're using today. This is great. And again, I think everybody out there has taken a look at their home from Google Earth or from any of the other sort of tools. Industry has been a driver on that. If industry is the driver on this level of transportation, you can only imagine what else they can be doing. And what's been fascinating in watching what SpaceX is doing, particularly with uh, their new vehicle that they're building off of the uh, coast of Texas down there, what SpaceX may be able to do for cargo around the world we know that they can haul cargo to space, but imagine hauling cargo it, literally within minutes, if not under an hour around the world. What a tremendous capacity builder that would be. Uh, so again, there's a lot of excitement here, seeing the commercial industry embrace this opportunity. They have seized it with both hands and are holding on tight. And I'm excited by what else is gonna happen. And I know at this year's symposium, we're gonna hear even more about that. Perfect, perfect. So uh, we're really excited now. We've got uh, Tim Gagnon's joining us today. Uh, Tim, you're just a little boring, but I think you're clearing up there a little bit. I see that uh, you've got a lot of that space memorabilia in your background. I can still tell what it is. So, Tim, we're glad to have you on today. Uh, but it's a pleasure to join you. Um, you, you always do incredible work, and uh, I was very, very honored. Uh, one of our guests a little bit later is going to be Emily Calandrelli, and she uh, has a, a contest called the Student Astronaut Contest, and I was able to be a finalist. I'm still the oldest finalist. I'm, I'm very excited about that. Uh, probably the fattest <laughs> that has ever been uh, one of the uh, one of the finalists uh, for. Ron, for we're just well rounded. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, I'm just don't worry, Ron. That's all it is. The Starship will be able to fly you. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're we're really excited about it, Yo Tim. We're going to talk to you here for just uh, just a few minutes about what's going on. You created a patch specifically for this event, and there's people that um, are very excited about it, including the local news. So let's start off with that first. Yeah, I, this was a, a bit of an unusual situation where we had something so historic as uh, astronauts returning to orbit from the Kennedy Space Center. But then we have a pandemic that doesn't allow us to all come together and enjoy the celebration. So I said, this context, this time, this place needs to be commemorated in a way that, uh, that makes sense. And so when NASA announced that they would request that people not come to Brevard County, to the Space Coast, to see the launch, uh, and that thereby not, if they did do that, they would be watching on NASA TV, on their smartphones, on their tablets, or so forth. I wanted to create a patch that would present that launch image as if you were watching it on your smartphone. The smartphone was chosen because it's the size of a patch that you can put on a sleeve of a jacket. Uh, you know, I couldn't put a flat screen as we're, we're talking four feet wide. Love it. And uh, you always do such incredible work. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, your your history in the space industry. You have been there at so many launches. Uh, I love one of the, one of my favorite things to watch on uh, your social media is uh, all the things that you talk about. Not only do you share big space um, big moments in space, but you share personal uh, stories about what, what has happened. You were there to see so much of it. You know, this is in your blood. So can you tell us a little bit about what it means to you that uh, we're launching again, what it's like to be there? I mean, you're, you live there. Your, your life on a day-to-day -day basis is right there on the Space Coast, and you get to live and breathe it all the time. And that's not what everybody's doing. So share a little bit that's about true. that with us. Well, I, I was born and raised in Connecticut. And uh, unless you worked for uh, United Technologies or Hamilton Standard at the time, you weren't connected to the space program. 
1991, my wife and I decided that, uh, with my encouragement mostly, that we needed to move from Connecticut to Brevard County to Titusville. Uh, if you look, uh, if you've been to US one in Titusville, you look across the Indian River, you see the VAB and the launch pads. And to me, that's like the front window, the picture window to the universe. Uh, you don't have to be out on the Space Center to enjoy the view of people and technology uh, leaving Earth to go into space. So once I we got settled in here in Titusville, I went to get involved in the space program. My first four way was uh, being a volunteer with the young astronaut program because back then it was still going strong. And I helped run a chapter when, and running a chapter in the shadow of Kennedy Space Center is probably the easiest thing you can do in life because there are so many professionals available to come and talk to your students. Well, I had started writing to astronauts way back in 1973 uh, because uh, my dad and I went to the Apollo 17 launch and that's where I learned that an outside artist could contribute to designing mission patches. Uh, the 17 patch was done by Robert McCall. And so I started writing astronauts then. I always got a nice warm response, thanked me for my interest and encouraged me to continue working on art. Uh, and it only took 31 years to succeed. and uh, I was chosen in 2004 to help create the Expedition 11 patch, which were the crew on orbit when Discovery returned uh, us to flight after the Columbia accident. And so having that ability uh, realized, then that crew talked to another crew and, uh, and we were able to, uh, to realize that dream more than once. And uh, you know, so Tim, you bring up such a, an awesome point there. It's something that we really like to highlight. Uh, you're an artist, and you get to be a part of the space industry. Um, you know, I'm a social media guy. You know, I get to be a personality. I get to talk to people that are doing amazing things in space, and I get, love what I get to do. I get to basically come on and just you know grin ear to ear and talk to the most incredible voices in the industry. And you do uh, amazing things with what you do. And one thing I, I love, and, I, and we'll definitely get back to the art part of this, is um, what. Uh, what is so amazing uh, about what you do is that you connect people through through art and it took you 30 years and you never gave up. Um, no. And that's something too. Uh, I was recently um, backstage during a panel that Frank White was a part of and it took him that long to be a part of it. And I think that's something that's, you know, kind of a, kind of amazing to talk about is that, you know, there's something about not giving up in this industry. Uh, you know, a, there, there's anything, if anything, SpaceX has been how close to being done and then just right there, they just said, you know what, sure. we're going to keep doing it. It was that last launch, sure. that last launch, that first successful one, had it not, I mean, that last one that would have been their last uh, their last chance became their first real success. And that would have mm -hmm. been the end of the, of the uh, company. So one, let's talk a little bit about never giving up and uh, also talking about being an artist in, in this area. Well, I was, uh, I'm, I'm self-taught. If I had not dropped out of college, if I had gone to art school and and uh, I probably would have had an easier road of it, but uh, you know, I was stubborn. I was young and impetuous and you couldn't tell me anything. So I made the, the journey more difficult than it had to be, but I was so enamored with space exploration and, and finding a way to contribute that I just kept at it. And, it, and that's, that's the lesson that my story can teach is that if there's something that you are just so passionate about, uh, overcome every obstacle, even the ones you put in your own way, and eventually you'll succeed. Um, being able to, uh, you know, create an image that people enjoy on a four by four inch canvas is a, a unique challenge, which is why so many of my commemoratives, Ron, are much larger than that. And, uh, you know, so it's not just... Uh this it's not just the patches that you do your art is also displayed in a couple different places um whenever mm -hmm. i went to uh, uh kennedy space center not too long ago uh, a friend of ours lynn took me out walking around and as she did she showed me one of the incredible pieces of art that you had up there so people may not know that about you you're obviously very famous for it and again i think you're actually going to be on an upcoming episode of uh emily's show right uh the exploration outer space or did that already happen and i missed it hopefully yeah, they, uh, they, they came to the house last january and spent the day and 
it was actually the day that we um, participated every year. Uh, ever since I moved to Titusville, I participate in the uh, astronaut memorial ceremony held by the town. And it happened to fall on the same day this year that Emily wanted to come and film. So part of her day with me was going to the ceremony and she got to experience that uh, with local people that just work behind the scenes on the space program and how they honor those that, and they felt that they let them down. Uh, you know, launch business is hard. It doesn't always work and you have to own up to uh, what happens and overcome it and fix it and, and move on. So that was part of the day, but it was a great day. I'm looking forward to the episode. Awesome. And uh, so Tim, let's talk a little bit about just, you know, we, we've got so much going on here. Uh, we're getting, we're going to bring on uh, Marcel, uh, who's part of our new gen team here in just a minute. And I think uh, Rich, did you have a question? I did have a question. Uh, and, and Tim, thank you again for joining us. You mentioned Robert McCall, who is sort of the, uh, the I will say, the, the Da Vinci of space artists that, oh, uh, easy. Uh, yeah. that, that people yeah. often talk uh, about and, and herald his work. Um, but every mission patch tells the story. Mm -hmm. And certainly the one that you shared about Expedition 11 is near and dear to your heart. But I'd be curious if there's a particular mission patch that you think uh, that, that you think tells a particular story that, uh, you know, it becomes the absolute sort of Rosetta Stone that everything sort of bases off of or that it's such a work of perfection that um, even uh, even Robert McCall couldn't uh, or, or yourself take it one other level up that the patch is so or the emblem is so perfect. I'd be curious to see if you hear your point on which one that might be. Uh, well, to me, my favorite Apollo patch and they were all beautiful. Don't get me wrong. Those were those were little master pieces of art. But my favorite was 17 because that encapsulated the entire program uh, for the Apollo program. It shows the they he used the uh, Apollo Belvedere statue in Rome as a model for the bust uh, for the the uh, profile of Apollo, and he's looking forward, and uh, you know he's got the wings, the 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 stylized eagle, the wing touching the moon that means that they have visited there and essentially conquered it, which was a bit of an overstatement. But the Eagle and the Apollo are looking forward to the future. Uh, and uh, so that one was always my touchstone. I mean, there, you know, there's so many artists that do incredible work. But for the 50th anniversary of Apollo, I uh, worked with my uh, partner, Dr. Jorge Cartz, who is, lives in Madrid, Spain. And um, we came up with a set for the Apollo uh, program, uh, both a mission patch updated and a spirit patch to try to capture the essence of that mission. And for Apollo, I've got it right here. We use the same uh, statue of uh, the Apollo Belvedere statue in Rome. And if, if you research the statue, he's actually an archer holding a bow and arrow. The, mm -hmm. the strap on his chest is for a quiver. And so I used um, the quiver, I turned it into a, a like a, a belt with all the mission numbers. Let me get this thing out of my face here. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I, you know you, how you see the uh, runners in the Olympics carrying the, uh, the victory lap, they're carrying the flag. Well, I draped Apollo in the American flag because that was, a unique American achievement. And the eagle uh, is stylized uh, after the Pratt & Whitney emblem because both my parents worked at Pratt & Whitney during Apollo. And then uh, Apollo is pointing towards Mars and the, the quote from Gene Cernan on the last uh, moonwalk, America's challenge of today um, uh, has forged man's destiny of tomorrow. And of course, that quote's a little bit dated nowadays because women astronauts are heavily involved where they weren't in 1972. So, but you know, when you're borrowing a quote, you have to borrow the quote. Right. Uh, so, but uh, uh, the other favorite patch of mine, uh, when I was getting those those wonderful rejection letters, and they were always gracious, um, they often said, 
that we already chose another artist and that artist was Robert McCall. He had designed probably seven or eight patches in the program, uh, the Apollo, uh, Apollo Soyuz and then shuttle. And when they were selected to fly, the 133 crew, the Discovery crew, was going to be the last mission. 134 and 135 weren't manifested yet. And uh, they went to Robert McCall to design their patch. And it was perfect bookends. He did STS-1, and he was going to do STS-133. And he uh, said, sure, I'd love to do that. And he did two hand-painted uh, sketches, essentially. And he mailed them off on a Friday, and he passed away on Saturday morning. He was 90 years old. So by the time the crew got the mail on Monday, they had already learned that he had died, and they didn't know what they were going to do. And then they received this package, and uh, they said, well, it's not quite finished yet. I mean, it's, it's still a little bit raw. What do we do with this? And Eric Bowe was the pilot of 133. He was also my contact uh, with uh, Jorge for 126. And Eric said, well, why don't we get Tim to finish it? So to me, it was like the Pope handing me Michelangelo's paintbrush and say, hey, finish this feeling. <laughs> and, and that was, I mean, I was scared, almost too scared to touch it because I'm not in Robert McCall's league. You know, and yeah, here, you look at the one chapel for me. I mean, yeah, exactly. And if you look at the 133 patch, the rough sketch of the orbiter that McCall painted, they use that exact image for the finished patch. And we, uh, you know, he had a few elements in there that they didn't want. They didn't want their names listed where he did. And he did something that I often do. He misspelled one of the crew's names. And, uh, you know, it happens. You're rushing to try to, to get something away, and uh, and you do that. But, you know, when you're creating art by hand, there's no spell check. You're you're the spell check. You so are it was nice check. to see that Robert McCall was human, like, you know, this guy. And uh, uh, That is an incredible, incredible story. And yeah. Again, I mean, it, it is, again, part of, I think, what makes the space community as unique as it is. Mm -hmm. Every mission has a story. Every patch tells a story. And, uh, you know, you as someone who is a, a practitioner of those emblems, we're fortunate to be in your orbit. And thank you for sharing your time with us. I appreciate it. It was wonderful. Tim, thank you so much. And uh, just so everybody knows, we're definitely going to have Tim on an upcoming show. Uh, there is going to be a little bit of change up. We've been doing space for you live uh, here in the past you know, few months uh, since everything's been going on with COVID. But we're going to switch it up and we're going to be doing some new stuff. So we're going to have some announcements about that. Make sure to check on our social media. But Tim is still on my list of people to dive into for a much deeper conversation. We can talk to him forever. So, uh, Tim, we appreciate you coming on. Thanks so much. I appreciate the uh, invitation. We're always glad to have you. We'll see you soon, sir. All right, so next up, we're going to talk a little bit uh, with uh, our main man out there in D.C. So we love having you uh, guys both piping in from uh, from out there uh, in D.C. where all these amazing things are going on. And uh, Marcel, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about something that Space Foundation does, uh, which is the Space Foundation's um, new gen. And so for those that don't know, Marcel, can you give us just a little bit of background on that? Yeah, yeah and Ron, this, well, I am still shaking uh, from, from that. I mean, that was, <laughs> we were so close <laughs> down, down to the wire. And, you know, and I was just kind of reflecting on it, you know, on one hand you're disappointed, but on the other hand, you know, I, I it speaks to the professionalism of the NASA and SpaceX teams that they, with such tremendous pressure, such a high profile launch carried on CNN, Fox news, MSNBC live, that they are, that they had the professionalism to, to stand down, uh, on, on something that was really on the bubble. And so I think that says a lot about the people that are in, in charge of those two organizations and about the, our, you know, our general community, that um, safety, safety first. Um, I think where our new gen programming comes in, you know, comes in kind of on the inspiration side of things. A lot of people ask, you know, what is the value of space, the value of Apollo, the value of the Saturn V? And I think it really comes down to that, group of, of young professionals and, and children that inspired to go into the space program of, of today, but also to engineering and STEM fields at large. And I think in the new gen program, we see ourselves as kind of creating that link. You know, when you're, when you saw, you know, I grew up and I saw the space shuttle 
And uh, that was that was tremendously interesting to me. But I wasn't really sure, you know, how do I bridge my interest in space with my career? And I went and I got into political science before I kind of saw the space industry light. Um, and I think what we like to do is to take young people, um, you know, that kind of like on the 18 to 35 and put everyone uh, put everyone together and, and show their their career paths. Um, so, for example, I think of the space symposium and and um, the ability for us to bring in people who are just starting their careers and put them in the rooms of senior leaders, for example, at our speed mentoring event where we had, I think it was, you know, 300, 400 young professionals that are at these tables and they're able to talk to leading CEOs and senior vice presidents, uh, you know, these people that are top in their field and get uh, networking experience from them, which is just something that, you know, does not happen very often in the community. And that really is the space, that, that's what makes Space Foundation such a, a unique organization is that we're able to bring these folks together. I agree 100%. So uh, Rich, do you want to put him, want to put him under the fire for a minute? So the boss is on the line. You think Marcel, he's like, look, I'm taking a drink of water real quick. <laughs> and Thomas and Han do a wonderful job of uh, making sure that uh, we at the Space Foundation are able to engage policymakers of all types and keep them informed on what's going on. Uh, you know, again, uh, space is a great bipartisan issue. And um, I think we see passion on both sides of uh, both sides of the aisle um, for people that want to go back to the moon, want to go back to Mars, or want to go to Mars and do all of those things. Uh, Marcel, I guess what I would ask is, uh, you know, for a young person who may be watching this right now uh, and, and is interested in space, you know, what's the best guidance and advice that you would have for them in wanting to start a career in this area? Yeah, I, I think my my advice would be to to reach out to uh, make the cold call, make the cold email, uh, and be be persistent and show your show your passion. Um, I think that that if you're if you're if you're a bit younger, you're just getting into college, and you're able to take STEM classes and engineering classes. I would, you know, as somebody who struggled through a lot of physics classes myself, I'd say don't don't get deterred if it doesn't immediately click. That it's a very difficult. Uh, that it's hard. It's hard for a reason, and in a lot of cases, it should be hard. But I think persistence is key, um, and I think uh, networking is is key as well. And putting yourself out there, uh, I think that you know, ninety nine times out of a hundred, that you will you will only benefit from putting yourself out there. Um, nobody, you know, very few people you know, see that as this annoyance. Instead, they see it as lifting up kind of the next generation of folks because they recall who you know when they were. That in your in your position, so definitely, I would say put yourself out there and don't be deterred. You know, if you have a a, you know, a bad test or two, because it it happens to to everybody. Yeah, I can say when it comes to physics, that's a class that uh, I'm I'm I can spell it. Uh, I know what goes up must come down and those types of things. But uh, I but my physics days uh, are well behind me <laughs> on that. Um, but I think, Marcel, your point about uh, not giving up is really true. And again, on a day when we had to press pause on today's launch, and again, mm -hmm. your comments about the professionalism of what was going on there, I think there were a lot of people, as you were watching any of the coverage that was going on, I think there are a lot of young people who saw a lot of people who look like themselves there today. Um, it's a very different mission control than it was uh, during the Apollo era, and that's great. Uh, we want to see more people as being part of that. I think your advice to young people is right on. Right, and I think uh, Administrator Brian Stein says this all the time. He talks about you know the Apollo generation, and this is the Artemis generation. These these programs, you know, they they. They take years and years and years, and, it, and they take they take careers, and they take de dedication and passion. And so, if it doesn't happen you know, immediately, I would say that's just there's plenty of opportunity involved in space into the future. It only you know beyond beyond the sky's the limit. You know, we're we're looking out to Mars for the next you know twenty thirty years. It's a very exciting time to start getting involved. And, uh, you know, that's a perfect segue into what I was going to ask. Let's talk a little bit about the fact that, you know, NewGen is going to have a, 
big, big piece of the Artemis gener- uh, of what's going on. We're referring to it as the Artemis generation. Actually, tomorrow uh, on Explore Mars, there's going to be an entire young professionals panel talking just about that. Uh, Becky, who was on earlier, she's going to be a part of that one. Uh, Karina Perez, which is a friend of ours, uh, was on um, a uh, panel with Rich and I last year at the Humans to Mars Summit. Uh, Mars is a big thing. You know, going back to the moon, the first woman on the moon, we have a lot of incredible things happening right now. So, you know, with what you, you've seen in the last couple of years, Space Symposium, you know, what is New Gen's role in getting us back to the moon and finally on to Mars? Finally, finally. <laughs> well, I mean, I, and I think that's why, you know, now we're at the point what's what SpaceX and a lot of these other, uh, you know, a lot of these other companies have done is they've, once you have this capability uh, that, that, you know, we're able to start launching uh, these, these heavier payloads more cheaply, sending crew to station much more cheaply, that really opens the aperture on, on, for, for startups, for medium-sized businesses, for all these, these hosts of, of great, fantastic ideas that have been searching for that cheap, low cost, lower cost launch option. You know, we're, starting to ha- we're starting to get to the point where the highway is about to open. Uh, I think the role, you know, the role of, of, of a young engineer and a, or a young person who's interested in policy, um, because I don't wanna, what I wanna emphasize, it's not just about engineers. You know, engineers are very important, but, uh, but it takes, an entire society, really, to get this to get this forward. You know, we need the artists, we need the writers, we need the policymakers, we need we need the engineers. And so, I think, uh, you know, these challenges that we're about to see to get to Mars are only going to get harder, right? You have, you look at you know, things like the radiation challenge, you know, extended life support. Uh, how do you have a, a base on Mars that you have to self sustain for two years without any you know, notable resupply. These are very tough problems and they're very interesting problems. They're very important problems. And I, you know, I think that, um, you know, I, I feel certainly fortunate to, to be where I'm at right now, but I could definitely, you know, part of me, I think we all get like this. You all, all want to be just, you know, just a bit, uh, a bit younger to, to, you know, to, to get on, get it, get into this industry and get onto these problems just a bit earlier. But, you know, I think, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in the next 10, 20 years after we get boots back on the moon and after we start planning out getting past the orbit of the moon and onto Mars. Love it. And so uh, and I know that obviously Space Symposium got moved back just a little bit. We're looking at it in the fall. Um, I, and I wasn't able to be in uh, in today's meeting or the one that was last week for, for New Gen that we always have, but I know that there's some things out there. So if there's anything that you can talk about, um, you know, about – what we're going to do with new gen in the fall. Uh, I think people would you know, like to be able to hear it, even if it's just like a tease of what we're looking at. Yeah, we're certainly, we're, we're certainly looking at, at getting our a fantastic agenda back. So this would be uh, so last year rather. So the 35th space symposium, for example, we had had Heather Wilson, the secretary of the air force keynote. Uh, we are very interested in looking at high impact speakers and then high impact mentors. And so if you're at, you know, I'll, I'll say if you're a, uh, a more experienced person, uh, who has some wisdom to share in the aerospace industry and you, you'd like to help mentor some of our, our, our of the younger folks and kind of uh, help in that, you know, that generational process of, of passing on lessons learned, feel free to reach out to us um, and we can, we can start kind of putting together a, a, a mentorship uh, agenda. I think we're also looking at different ways that we can engage more virtually. I think that's one of the more really interesting things that COVID and, you know, coronavirus has shown us that, that, Although in-person connection is, is important, there are certainly plenty of connections that we can make virtually that we can include people from across the, across the nation and across the globe. And I think that's something that we're, we're currently looking at uh, in, the, in the next few weeks to months. Uh, such perfect timing uh, to uh, one. Thank you for the words and coming on today, Mortel. And uh, what better person that's a representation for New Gen than former NASA rocket rocket scientist Kevin De Bruin, uh, the fit rocket scientist himself? I don't know if you go by that anymore, but I will never not remember <laughs> you as that. Um, so we're we're really glad to have you on, Marcel. Thank you for coming on, giving us all, yeah, your, uh, all your insights for that man. We can't wait. Uh, we got mu- so much more coming up soon. Uh, our trivia just killed it. So don't forget that we're going to be doing another one of those here in the very near future. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. All right. We'll see you soon. 
So Kevin, um, you know, we, we love having you on Rich. I want to drop you out of here for yeah. just a minute. So that way I can talk to Kevin, but I'll have Rich in the background. So anytime you get to say to your boss, I'm like, Hey, I'm just going to put you in the back for a minute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he's like, okay, well, this good to see you again, Rich. <laughs> good to see you, Kevin. Hey, Kevin, we're grateful for what you do and, uh, and everything that you do again, uh, pleasure to have you on the program. And, uh, you know, as Kevin, uh, I'm sorry, as, as Ron has said, I'm going to go backstage. We're gonna have it backstage for a little bit, right. so uh, you know, <laughs> glad to glad to reunite us after last year at Space Symposium where we talked about social yeah. media and you know what a perfect person to have on and talk to uh, everything about everything today. So you got a background in NASA, uh, you know that's something amazing. Just a little bit. Uh, well, oh, one, yeah. let's just let's just touch on that before we dive into everything. The yep, hundred and twenty plus applications that you put yep. in just to get uh, an internship. And look at where you're at now. Look at the things that you've done. So let's just talk a bit, a little bit about your background before we talk a little bit about uh, today and uh, you know what's coming up. Yeah, so I knew I wanted to work at NASA since I was about 10 years old. I saw the movie October Sky when I was a little kid. I'm like, that's cool. Like, I want to design spaceships for NASA. So fast forward to what you said, Ron, was that it took me you know over 150 applications to get my first NASA internship over three years. I just kept on applying. I'm like, one of these will eventually turn out. And it did. I got an internship at NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. And while I was there, I realized that I really didn't have the education necessary to be a full-time NASA employee. I was doing undergrad at a school in Wisconsin in mechanical engineering. I'm like, I need grad school and I need aerospace engineering. So I jumped into that. I'm like, okay, where do I want to go to grad school? I found Georgia Tech. It's the only place I wanted to go. And they rejected me. Uh, they got the, that, that little offer that says, we regret to inform you. I was like devastated. I'm like, this is the only lab in the country that does what it does in terms of system engineering with NASA. I'm like, how do I get in? So eventually after talking with the Dean of Admissions for a few weeks, he let me into the school. I eventually got a graduate research assistantship, which means they paid for all of my tuition and gave me a stipend to do research. So that was spectacular. And then I set my sights on NASA JPL. As I was approaching graduation a couple months away, went through three rounds of interviews, the last one being an eight hour interview on NASA JPL's campus, giving an hour long presentation to a panel, doing one on one interviews, one on two interviews with like drilling me with questions. Felt pretty good coming out of that, but I didn't get given the job. So I'm graduating in two months and I'm like, not working at NASA. Um, what am I going to do? Well, I was able to get a 10 week internship. I was doing research with NASA JPL at the time in grad school. And one of my mentors was able to bring me on. He's like, I can give you 10 weeks. But after that, like, you know, there's nothing I can give you. So take those 10 weeks and prove to them that you belong. So in those two, two months before graduation, I decided, okay, I'm going to graduate without a full-time job. I'm going to take this 10-week internship and figure it out, like make it happen. So for the first five weeks of the internship, didn't really like fight for the job too much, kind of just really established a great work ethic, just networking. And the last five weeks was all, hey, knocking on doors. My name's Kevin. You want to hire me? And I had over 30 interviews in those last five weeks going around asking people to hire me. And on the last day of my internship, I was told that I was going to be hired as a full-time NASA engineer. I was like, wow. So a real quick replay was the three years and over 150 applications to get that first NASA internship. Georgia Tech rejected my application for grad school, but then ended up paying for all of it and paying me to do research. NASA JPL said, nope, you don't get the full-time job, but then getting hired on as a NASA engineer to work on the most advanced missions that they have. I was in the advanced design engineering group where I'm working on the missions that are 10, 20, 30, 40 years in the future, doing the cutting edge. Like Europa missions was my main focus, working on the Europa Lander, the Europa Clipper from grad school and into my job at JPL. So I, whenever I recount that story, Ron, it's just, it's kind of humbling to look back on it and be like, wow, I made this this thing happen. And I love sharing the story. You know this, not do, for my man. own personal pride, but to show people that it's not impossible. Some people got it a lot easier. Trust me. I've met some people like, yeah, my, my dad worked here. I interned and then I got hired. I'm like, must be nice. Yeah. But anywhere you come from, it is possible to make your dream come true. That's why I like to share that. I love it. And uh, so up next, we're going to have the Lieutenant Governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor Diane Primavera is going to join us uh, after Kevin. Um, but uh, so, you know, uh, so big leading, Kevin. So we, you've got to answer the big question. It's yeah. you, you sit on stage at TEDx and you said, you know, without space, we die. 
why does space exploration matter? It's that big question that everybody always asks, like, why why space exploration? We all, we have all these problems here. And when you and I know the answer to that, and I don't think there's anybody better to, to give it to us. So uh, give, us, uh, give us the breakdown. Why is it so important? Well, space is so important. We'd like to highlight the wonders of space exploration, but we've really got to remember its importance to us here on Earth. There are so many technologies. Literally, the reason that we are communicating right now, me and Ron and you watching us, is because of space technology, long distance communication, everything that we're using from the image sensors in these camera phones to whenever you go out in the, in the, the normal, normal world, because we're on quarantine, so I'm not driving around too much. But when you're on the freeways, you know those grooves you see in the freeways? You're like, why are they there? Well, that comes from NASA landing tires from like airplane on wet runways, trying to figure out better ways to have traction. So this was done back in the 80s, and we saw a 90% reduction in freeway accidents once those grooves were put in the roads, and that came from space technology. Now, the, the one story that I really like to highlight is how it can literally save lives. So we use LED lights to grow plants on the International Space Station, right? Well, a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Wisconsin hometown, woo -woo, figured out a way to take that LED light growing technology plants and turn it into a cancer treatment. So we activate cancer medication with these LED lights. And there's a man from Buffalo, New York named George Grace, who is cancer free today because of that treatment. So he literally owes his life to space technology. And I can get into like everything else from running shoes to, to airbags, to firefighter gear, to shock absorbers in cities like me here in LA and Tokyo that come from the dampers during rocket launches as we almost witnessed one today, buildings stay afloat. They stay up during earthquakes because of those dampers allowed the movement to happen with those giant structures. And all of that is coming from the space industry. So if we didn't have space industry technology in our lives, we really wouldn't be here right now. And it's kind of fearful to think of what would happen in our future if we decide to move away from space and say, oh, we need to focus on the things here on earth. Well, it's the going out into outer space those space technologies venturing out there that pull us forward here in our everyday life on Earth. Uh, so, uh, Kevin, thank you so much for coming on today and just giving your, your words of wisdom and also sharing what is a very inspiring story. If people don't know you, they're like, oh, he's a tall, the tall, handsome guy that did American Ninja Warrior. Everything came <laughs> easy to him. And that is absolutely not the truth. Um, and I have it. I think it's sitting on the desk over there. I still keep uh, keep your book at, very near me. Um, so uh, cool. love what you did at NASA and beyond. If you all haven't checked it out yet, please do. It's an incredible book. The Audible, he narrates it. Kevin's got a good voice. So, uh, you know, go and listen to him. And uh <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, hey, let everybody know just real quick. You got 30 seconds. Tell everybody where they can find your new YouTube series uh, that you're doing to inspire kids uh, during this time of COVID. Yeah, A Place Called Space. So YouTube.com slash A Place Called Space. I'm going live every Tuesday and Thursday mornings at 9 a.m. Pacific time to teach a space class for about 30 minutes. Like we cover everything from the intro to the solar system to black holes to exoplanets. The Big Bang is a topic that's coming up and also how fast can we go in outer space is the new topic next Tuesday. So make sure you pay attention. Come on in and join me on youtube.com slash a place called space. And if you want to like hang out on the Instagram version right down here, that's my Instagram. That's where you find all my stuff and links to the YouTube site as well. Exciting. Kevin, thank you so much for coming on and joining us today, man. You're always an incredible guest. I think this is the seventh interview that we've done. You you will remain at the top of the list of the person <laughs> I've talked to the most on live stream. So, so glad to have you, man. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Ron. Enjoy the rest of the stream. Will do. And, uh, you know, we, we can't be more honored to, to, than to uh, bring on our next guest today. Hello, Lieutenant Governor Diana P uh, Diane Primavera. How are you doing today? Thank you for joining us and giving uh, some comments today on the amazing people in the space industry here in Colorado. I'm doing great. Can you hear me? I can. We can hear you and we can see you. Uh, thank you. And so just a quick note is that uh, so she's been backstage for about 20 minutes now. And I was like, you know what, if you you don't have to stay if you don't want to. She's, so the very first thing that she said is like, you know, know what? Uh, I, there's so much I need to learn about aerospace. And I love listening to this. So thank you for uh, for joining us today and talking with us a little bit about all the amazing things that are going on. And uh, I'll give it over to you so you can uh, share your thoughts with us today. Well, great. Well, I wish I hadn't seen Kevin. He's a hard act to follow, but uh, <laughs> thank you uh, for inviting me to join you at this exciting launch party. It still is exciting, even though the uh, 
event was scrubbed until Saturday. So first I'd like to thank the Space Foundation for hosting the watch party. I'd also like to express our appreciation for their flexibility in rescheduling the Space Symposium, which is now scheduled for October 31st through November 2nd. So mark your calendars. And we're looking forward to welcoming everyone back to Colorado. Uh, the Space Foundation is a critical partner in Colorado's aerospace ecosystem. The Space Foundation presents the General James E. Hill Lifetime Space Achievement Award annually during the Space Symposium, which is the highest honor that they bestow. Uh, General Hill was an Air Force General and Commander in Chief of the North American Air Defense Command and the U.S. Air Force Aerospace Defense Command with consolidated headquarters at Peterson Air Force Base, Colorado Springs, Colorado. <clears throat> this award recognizes outstanding individuals who have distinguished themselves through lifetime contributions to the welfare, welfare or betterment of humankind through the exploration, development, and use of space, or the use of space technology information. Themes or resources in academic, cultural, industrial, or other pursuits of broad benefit to humanity. So thank you to the Space Foundation for your continued support of the aerospace industry. I would also like to congratulate SpaceX on their significant achievements in advancing human space flight from US soil. The successful future of human space flight and space exploration hinges on the robust partnership between government and industry that exemplifies the commercial crew program Demo2 launch. So congratulations again. So as a Lieutenant Governor of the great state of Colorado, I have the opportunity to serve as the co-chair of the Colorado Space Coalition and the national vice chair of the Aerospace States Association. Over the last 17 months, I've had the privilege of working closely with our aerospace partners, and I'm continuously awestruck by the brilliant and innovative minds pushing our understanding of the cosmos on a daily basis, which today was, should have been fully on display, but will be hopefully on Saturday. Sitting at the foot of the Rocky Mountains, Colorado is already a mile closer to the final frontier. We also possess a, a unique blend of military installations and commands, private aerospace companies, academic and research institution, institutions, and government entities. This unique ecosystem has made Colorado the top state in the nation for private aerospace employment per capita and the second in total private aerospace employment. Over 30,000 Coloradoans are directly employed by aerospace companies. In addition, over 200,000 Coloradoans are either directly or indirectly employed by the aerospace industry. These workers are employed by more than 180 aerospace companies, and of these companies, nearly 84% are small businesses. So our robust aerospace industry contributes approximately $15.4 billion to our economy. An additional 500 companies provide space-related products and services. They help propel Colorado to the fourth largest high-tech industry concentration nationally. In addition, these companies, Colorado also possesses an innovative research environment, locations like the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics at the University of Colorado Boulder and Colorado State's University's Cooperative Institute for Research in the Atmosphere, not to mention the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, help us better understand our world and the cosmos beyond. They also help Colorado command the fourth most NASA Prime contract awards. Finally, Colorado has the second most qualified workforce in the country, with 49% of our residents being college educated. Our institutions of higher learning from the Colorado School of Mines to Fort Lewis College, from the US Air Force Academy to Metropolitan State University of Denver provide critical pipelines to our aerospace industry. As a Lieutenant Governor, I'm immensely proud of our Colorado aerospace ecosystem. The role it plays in our economy, the role it plays in national security and homeland defense, and the role it plays in our communal understanding of our world. And when it comes to the successful implementation of Space Policy Directive 1 and the Artemis mission, Colorado is leading the way. Multiple Colorado companies from our, our aforementioned aerospace ecosystem are part of the teams designing and developing the Lunar Human Lander System, including Sierra Nevada Corporation, United Launch Alliance, Lockheed Martin, 
Northrop Grumman, and Maxar Technologies. United Launch Alliance, headquartered in Colorado, will also play a role in the administration's focus on returning to the moon and going to, on, on to Mars. ULA's first Vulcan launch will be carrying the astrobiotic lander to the moon, and they are also partnering with Dynetics and Blue Origin on the HLS launches. Colorado's contribution also includes companies such as Sierra Nevada Corporation and Lockheed Martin working to develop prototypes to deep space habitats. Our friends at Boeing are also working on a deep space habitat from their facility in Alabama. But it's not just developing the launch, landing, and living in space elements where Colorado is leading the way. Effective mining and utilization of space resources is going to be vital for lunar settlement and further space exploration. And here in Colorado, the Colorado School of Mines Center for Space Resources offers the world's first multidisciplinary graduate course in developing field of space resources. So today's launch party further exemplifies the amazing and world-changing work taking place across our aerospace industry. So I'm humbled by the opportunity to be a part of this monumental event. And finally, I'd also like to personally thank our aerospace partners for their support of our local, state, national, and global response to COVID-19. I cannot imagine a better partner than all of you as we respond to the daunting global challenge. So thank you again, and thank you all again for having me, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the launch party, and we'll see you again on Saturday. Uh, thank you so very much for joining us, uh, Lieutenant Governor, and uh, Rich, I'm sure you want to give a quick thank you to her as well. So, Absolutely, Governor, and, and, and I want to thank you and, and the state. You guys have been wonderful partners, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, we're looking forward to bringing uh, everybody back to Colorado. Uh, the end of October, uh, beginning of November, and reconvening that space community. And again, want to thank you and the governor for your leadership in helping uh, make sure that everybody in the state is uh, safe and healthy and looking out for the first responders and all the medical personnel who've been taking care of everyone. Uh, we're fortunate to have your leadership and the governor's leadership in those areas. And thank you for your time and your leadership for all of those things. Well, thank you. You all do such a great job. Thanks a lot. And there we go. Let me unmute myself. Thank you once again, Diane uh, Primavera, our Lieutenant Governor, and such a big advocate for space. We were thrilled to have you on today. Thank you. So, Emily, how's it going? So, uh, we, we definitely want to talk a little bit about all the amazing things that are going on with you today. I'm so glad that you were able to join. So, if you don't know who Emily Calandrelli is, shame on you. You absolutely should. Um, you know, so uh, obviously, uh, it, it's a big moment for me, biggest fan. Um, so we're glad to have you on. And uh, Rich, I'm going to put you backstage again, unless you want to say hello to Emily, which you may. Emily, it is great to have you. <laughs> we are fortunate to have you in our orbit. One of the things that's great about the Space Foundation is all the incredibly cool people that we get to work with. But most of all, the best part about the cool people we work with are all the things that you do to bring more people into the space community. So thank you for what you do. I'm going to go backstage because Ron's just shoved me off there with his broom. <laughs> thank you for what you do. Thanks, Rich. So Emily, uh, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about it. Uh, so you were talking in, uh, in the backstage <laughs> chat there. You said, you know, the heart's still pumping a little bit. It's been a pretty crazy day. So tell us about what you're feeling right now. Ron, like I need a nap. <laughs> My anxiety levels have just been like a roller coaster all day. And it's just like an emotional high and low and high and low. And so now I guess we just will just wait till Saturday at 3.22 p.m. Eastern time, I believe, for the next try. But, oh, it's been a day. <laughs> it really has. And, uh, you know, I tried to sleep last night. I think I did. I'm not really sure. I don't remember. It's all been a blur the last few weeks anyway. There's just been so much going on. And uh, let's talk a little bit about that. You have been very, very busy um, there. And I don't really know that I can think of a television personality that um, has d dove in as, as deeply as you have uh, with all the stuff you've been doing. There was a daily show that you were doing for a while. You're constantly putting stuff out. You went on TikTok and started, you know, messing with the trolls, which has been super funny. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about some of the amazing things that you've been doing online oh, wow. and, uh, then we'll dive into your show and all that fun stuff yeah so um with everything going on we've had to pause filming for our show which has been really difficult because we are kind of halfway through filming and now we're we're really trying to figure out how we're going to get the rest of it filmed so we can give this content out to you all because we have some shows that i'm just like 
personally, I think they're like the best episodes that we've ever created. And I'm like, oh, we have to find a way to make this happen. So that's what's kind of happening behind the scenes right now. But in the meantime, I have started a YouTube channel. I have started a TikTok channel. I am just like trying to find all the different ways to do science communication. Um, just like you, I think we're all trying to find creative ways to reach out to people during this time. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. It's been exhausting. I feel like I'm trying to be like a teen being on TikTok, um, but it's been actually really fun. So yeah, just trying to make the most out of this weird time. Uh, and you always do. So let's talk a little bit about that. So the show, Exploration Outer Space, uh, I've never heard of it. Definitely have never watched any episodes before ever. Uh -huh. uh, so <laughs> if people have not heard of it, can you tell us a little bit about what your show is and uh, all the amazing things that you get to do on that, which I'm super jealous of. Rich, I need a TV show. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. So Exploration Outer Space is a show on Fox and Amazon Prime. It's a Saturday morning show. And it is all about how space is so cool. I mean, if I had to like just put it succinctly, it is just like why the space industry is amazing. And so as the host, I get to travel to all of these different NASA centers, to private space companies, to universities, to schools, to cover projects and programs that are happening in the space the space industry right now. So we cover everything from rockets and spaceships to rovers on Mars and searching for aliens and everything in between. And Ron, as you know, like my background is in this stuff. Like I studied aerospace engineering for eight years. And so for me to be able to have a job like this, it's quite literally a dream come true. And uh, so one thing that I always love to mention uh, that I get to brag on is that we're both from the same state. We're both mm -hmm. from West Virginia and there's not a whole lot of, we don't have it's a whole actually, lot of time. Uh, the, um, IV and V facility. This is the NASA facility in West Virginia, renamed to the Katherine Johnson facility. Uh, yeah. Well, and that's that, that was going to be the, the next point is that there's not been a whole lot, but one of the things that really stands out is that uh, you know two of our biggest voices are, are women. Uh, it's you, you know, Katherine Johnson. If you've seen Hidden Figures, um, you know, uh, one. If you haven't, please go read the book. Check out the movie. It's incredible. It's just this incredible story. And, um, you know, Catherine was this incredible voice and she was behind uh, a lot of NASA's early successes with when she was a human computer. <laughs> you know, before we had computers, yeah. computers, they walked into a room that took up a room and said, this is going to take our job, please. Uh, you know, and so they did incredible work. But you are such an incredible voice uh, for our state um, and science communication in general. So I know that's got to mean a lot to you. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. if you've never been to West Virginia. We're incredibly proud to talk about where we're from because nobody right. else really does. And we we make sure that we say it. Uh, we're very loud and proud about it. So let's talk a little bit about that and, and your role as just one of these really great voices. Yeah, I mean, West Virginia is an incredible state, a beautiful state. And a lot of times the stories that come out of West Virginia are not, um, do not like hold us in the brightest light. And so I think it's really important to show that we have incredible assets coming out of West Virginia. We have like the engineering program, the university, West Virginia University, where I went to undergrad is such an incredible school. And I was so lucky to have gone there. I mean, their, their engineering program is top notch. Our robotics teams consistently competes at the national level and beats teams like MIT and Carnegie Mellon and like these names that you've heard of and you affiliate with like really great intellect and especially things with like robotics, for example, and teams from West Virginia have beat them like for the past few years. And so it's like, we have a lot of great resources at our disposal there. The NASA uh, Independent Verification and Validation Facility there, the Captain Johnson facility now, um, and the Green Bank Observatory is in West Virginia. So there's just incredible things going on in the States. And yeah, if you haven't been there, you should visit. And, uh, you know, it would be remiss, you know, the reason why I reached out to you was what perfect person, what more perfect person would there be to talk to about the fact that, uh, you know, we just had the first all women spacewalk. I think we actually ended up with two of them. And then uh, we're also looking at Artemis. This is the this is the first step to the first woman stepping on the moon. And that's yeah. a really big thing. So I know that uh, with everything that you put out there, you're a big proponent for women in STEM um, and, and equity and equality. And uh, I think that that's something yeah. really great to touch on uh, as kind of. You know, what are, what are your thoughts about that? How excited are you? Like, where do you want to be when that happens? <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, my first thought is, like, it's about time. You know, I wish that, that it, this has happened 
this had happened during the Apollo era, because now we're in a situation where I think it's still hovering around like maybe 12 percent, 11 to 12 percent of all humans that have ever gone to space have been women. Like, that's not a lot. That's not a lot. And so I'm really excited to get those numbers up. Um, and not just because like I want to see myself and the people that are going into space. Representation is just so incredibly powerful. And that's very, very important on, you know, who we are inspiring with space exploration. Um, but also because when you go to space, you come back with this unique perspective of how to approach life. They talk about the overview effect. You see Earth without the borders between states. You see Earth with this incredibly thin atmosphere. It changes your perspective on how to be a better human, how to be a better neighbor, how to be a better steward of humanity and the environment. And astronauts come back and they do really important work. They go on to work in Congress to influence policy. They go on to work in other parts of Capitol Hill. They they work as environmentalists, they work as artists, they they write books, they do all of these things where they share their knowledge. And we're right now getting a very limited perspective on who is able to share that knowledge uh, and what knowledge that they're what knowledge they're sharing and who it's really for. And so I'm really, really excited for us to expand that story to include more people, more perspectives, more people of color more people of different backgrounds, more women. I'm just like, I'm, I'm so excited for the Artemis program. Well, uh, it, it's always great to have you on. And you know what? There's a perfect person that we're, we're having joining us now. Uh, so we've had two people minimum. I'm sorry, three. I didn't count myself. That really you know, was not trying to do that. Uh, but we've had uh, three people on the show today that have been a part of your show. You were really uh, great mm -hmm. about highlighting different things. Um, we were really excited when you reached out to us about um, we're going to have our astronaut uh, on the show eventually once everything calms down. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're really uh, we're really glad to, to have you on because you're such a great representative of it. So this is actually an awesome question that I would love to ask both of you. So uh, Tanya, I think we still have you muted. Let me unmute you there. Um, if you had the chance to go to space, would you want to go even just like a suborbital flight? Because we're looking at commercial, like commercials coming up. We're going to see, we might see Wally Funk, um, Wally, Wally Funk fly a little bit later this year. That's not a tongue twister. Um, so yeah, I think that we've got some, uh, some really great, incredible opportunities coming up here soon. So is there anything that, you know, would you like to go? Would you like to get that orbital perspective that, uh, you know, that view from space? I mean, ideally, yes, but I'm also terrified of flying, so I might have to do it like with a bunch of sedatives to make it more of a calm experience. <laughs> How about you, Emily? You want to fly? Oh, yes, but I'm sort of in the same boat. Like, I want to wait until it is incredibly safe because, like, I appreciate that there are explorers out there willing to risk their lives to do that. Um, I, I, I need to wait a little while for me to feel comfortable doing that. But yes, I would love to do it. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, Emily, thank you so much for coming on and joining us today. I know that, you know, everybody and their mother's trying to get to you right now. So thank you for, for joining us and, and putting, uh, putting us on that list of people to talk to. We appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Ron. Thanks for having me. Yep. See you later. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Tanya, what's happening? So, what better person could we talk to? Um, we're we're gonna wrap up the show with a couple of uh, a couple of Martians, and the professional Martian is the per perfect person to go to first. Um, today, you know, obviously we had to it, they had to step down. That's fine. Everything is uh, it, that just kind of happens. But um, I think something that a lot of people may not understand is that there is so much that happens with the robotics missions that you know kind of get us started first before we before we send humans. It's always better to send robots, and uh, you have a storied history with more than a few of them. So let's talk about those just for a minute. We've got perseverance coming up. You worked on a bunch, so can you give us your background and what you've worked on uh, with the Mars missions before, and kind of how those help us with uh, getting humans, uh, you know, back to the moon and then onto space. I mean, onto Mars. Yeah, sure. So my background has mostly been in camera systems. I worked on cameras on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, the Opportunity Rover, the Curiosity Rover, and the Perseverance Rover. And these are really important. People tend to just think of images as being pretty pictures, but they're actually really important data for us. We need to know what the areas are like that we want to use as landing sites, both from orbit for the rovers, but also from orbit for where we might want to send humans down the line. Um, we also need to be able to prospect for resources if you're going to be sending humans. And so we want to know, in the case of Mars, where is their ice? 
and particularly like where is that ice easily accessible? How clean is it? Um, and so we need to do a lot of reconnaissance before we can send humans because otherwise you might get there and not be fully prepared for what you might be uh, running into on the ground. And so the next Mars mission is coming up. It's Perseverance. So we're looking at it. So after this launch, I mean, I can't think of anything that that's bigger um, that's going to happen this year or even in the next few years other than you know the next you know uh, crewed mission, right? Mm -hmm. um, but Perseverance is huge. Uh, it's you know going to be. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that life in the universe. We we we're really excited about the prospects of having uh, you know an astrobiology uh, piece to this mission that's mm -hmm. coming. So uh, and I know that you had a little bit of a hand in working on it too as well, right? Uh, I was on the operations team for the mast cameras, so the zoomable eyes of the rover. Um, they were built by the same company that built the eyes for Curiosity, and I used to work for that company as well. Um, so I don't have anything to do really with the life detection instruments, but that's the most exciting part of, of sorry, not Curiosity, of Perseverance. We have some really great instrumentation. Some of it is the Curiosity instrumentation that's been souped up. So we had uh, the laser that breaks down rocks to tell us what they're made out of on Curiosity. That's called ChemCam. On Perseverance, we have SuperCam. Um, we have better eyes than we had on the last rover. The wheels have been improved. There's a sort of new and improved weather station on board. But we also have a few really important things for astrobiology. We have a Raman spectrometer, which is the first time we've ever sent that particular instrument to Mars. And those are really good at looking at organic material, which is not necessarily a sign of life. And that's a really important distinction because sometimes that gets a little confusing in the media, but it is an important uh, ingredient for life. We're carbon-based life, right? So we need to see that's there to know whether or not life could have been there in the first place. Um, we also have a sample caching instrument on board. And so the rover is actually going to go and take little samples and essentially put them in vials, drop those vials in a box, and then plop that box out behind it and keep driving along on its mission. And sometime, probably in the late 2020s, another rover, right now just called the Fetch rover, is going to go get those samples and bring them back to Earth. We're still working on that design because we've never actually sent anything back from Mars yet. So figuring out how to actually find it, pick it up, and send it back to Earth is a whole nother engineering challenge. Uh, but I think that the folks at JPL should be able to figure that out. And so uh, you worked on a, a few different missions, and I know that Oppie was very close to you, uh, close to your heart, and you know it kind of broke us, uh, broke us all a little last year, uh, especially with its final message. I'm not going to say it aloud because I'm trying to finish this whole thing without crying, and I've already managed that since we didn't actually have the launch. Uh, so uh, I know that that meant a lot to you, and also, and I know that you've talked about the cameras as well uh, in your TEDx talk. It was very important to say, you know, I was the first person to see this image of Mars. You know, that was me. That was, and that's a really cool thing. So you talked a little bit about uh, your your history and you know what Oppie in particular meant to you. Yeah, it's there's something that is so special about getting to work directly on those missions. Even when you're a scientist working on stuff like this, a lot of the time you're a scientist that's using data that comes from these spacecraft, but there's a team that's getting that data and processing it and figuring out what we're going to take pictures of and how we're going to take those pictures and then delivering it to the scientists to use. So to be the person that's actually at the front of that loop and telling the camera what to do and getting to pick the images that the camera is taking and then seeing those when they get back to Earth, when they're coming down through the deep space network and realizing that you're the first human, sometimes on the entire planet that has ever seen this particular piece of Mars at all or at the resolution that you're looking at, or maybe the first person to see that particular feature. Uh, it's it's a really powerful feeling and, and really cool. And I never got sick of it. Every single day that I would go in, even though my job, I guess one could say was monotonous because you do the same thing every single day you never knew what you were going to see. And so I was excited. I would come in and the first thing I wanted to do every morning was to look at the images that came back the day before, before I even checked my email or anything else. I was like, what do we have back from the satellites or the rovers? Uh, and one of the things that you're well known for is your enthusiasm for this. You're always tweeting about it. You're a wonderful voice for anything and everything having to do with space. And uh, we, we greatly appreciate that you do do that. Um, and so you were recently on our uh, episode of A Space for You Live. So if nobody's seen that yet, I just put the link down below there so you can see it. But, you know, as a science communicator, you are everywhere. You rarely say no to anything. And it's very appreciative because there's plenty of people that, you know, um, it's not like you're not busy. It's not like you don't have like six full-time jobs. So, I mean, it's something that, that really, really matters to you. Do we, we, well, we, I think we made, uh, I made the joke not too long ago, Tanya and I were talking about doing a full interview and that's eventually coming up. Um, but I said that we should schedule an hour interview and then neither of us show up so we can go take a nap. 
uh, <laughs> separately, <laughs> separately, like in our own houses, uh, you know, across the country from each other. Yeah. But you know, it's <laughs> just one of those things we laughed about because it's just we, we do so much because it is it's just something that is you can't help it when you have this kind of passion and uh, share a little bit about like, you know, what you do and how you get out there, um, your website, where people can find you. Uh, so you can find me pretty much anywhere on the internet as at Tanya of Mars, um, mostly on Twitter, but Instagram, medium, Facebook, all that kind of stuff. Um, I talk mostly about Mars as the name would suggest. Um, but I also like to talk about just space in general. Um, I talk a lot about some earth observation work since right now I work for a private earth observation company and how that can help us tie things into planetary exploration, so beyond Earth, um, and also a lot of stuff about increasing accessibility in the sciences, particularly the geosciences, because my background is mostly geology, uh, for people with disabilities, because science at the beginning is, is not super friendly to a lot of people, and when you're going into something like geosciences, which is typically incredibly physically demanding, it can be very, very hard for anybody with any kind of physical disability to participate. And I know that it greatly impacted my ability to perform in graduate school and to really get the full benefit of some of the classes that I took. It also affected some of my grades um, in ways that it, it shouldn't have because th there's ways that we can accommodate for these things. And so I'm pretty open on social media about the things that I deal with through some of the health problems that I have. I have a degenerative condition called ankylosing spondylitis. And I want people to realize that even if you have health problems, you can still achieve your dreams. And I think that doing this stuff every day, it's actually a really good distraction for me because I, I told somebody at one point, they asked, how do you do so much stuff? while you're sick. And I said, well, I'd rather feel crappy doing something that I enjoy rather than feel crappy while I'm sitting at home on my couch, you know, eating potato chips or something like that. So it's a distraction and it keeps me busy and it keeps me happier than I would be if I wasn't doing what I love. Uh, I, love, I love that. And you are such an incredible inspiration to so many people. Um, so just for uh, you know a quick one, you've, you've accomplished so much um, and so young, which is impressive. Same thing with Emily and same thing with so many of the people that we have on. So uh, for those that may be listening that, that you inspire, can you give us you know just some some words of advice for them, especially because it's something we don't talk about enough. Is, uh, um, and I think that the first time I saw uh, I ever saw the hashtag with you was disability in STEM, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we definitely want to highlight a little bit more in the future. It's uh, some things that I, I think it's important to talk about. Um, I have a great friend that uh, his daughter has um, uh, has uh, I'm blanking on it now. There's because there's two people. I was going to say uh, she had uh, so one one of my friends has autism. Uh, his son has autism, and they do really amazing things. And then uh, it's just something that we see out there so often, um, but not a lot of people talk about. It, and that's a big role for you. So to, to those that you inspire, um, you know, what is your what are your words of wisdom? Oh, that's deep. Uh, <laughs> I would say just be really proactive. And if there's something that you really want to do, it may not be easy to make that happen, but there's ways that you can find your path around all of that and figure out how to get what you, get what you want and be able to do what you want to do. Um, I, I don't try to say that it's going to be easy. My path has certainly not been easy. And there've been a few times where I thought that I wasn't gonna be able to do this. Um, and every day it's it can be a struggle. Even just physically being able to get out of bed is a struggle some days but I still do it because this is what I love. And if you can keep that focus on this thing that's outside of all of the stuff that you might be dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, you can use that as your drive to keep going. Uh, seriously, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your insights as always. Uh, uh, it's always uh, fascinating to listen to you. Any Anytime you do a show, there's always something new. Um, so if you haven't checked out all the stuff that Tanya's doing, please do so and let me actually uh, get back get that back up here so people can find it. Um, so there, all across the bottom there is the information um, that you where you can find her and what you can uh, what you can do to be a part of the amazing things that she shares. Um, so uh, and this is a big one. Uh, Patrick Harper says she's the one who taught me planetary geology is even a thing. Uh, definitely my personal inspiration. Uh, and that's, and by the way, his brother is a geologist and his brother didn't teach him that there was such thing as planetary geology. Uh, oh, geology. Wow. So shame on you, Chris, but no, I'm just kidding. They're, uh, they're, they're, they're some, a part of my family and uh, I met them from a uh, space symposium. So uh, thank you for coming on today and joining us. We appreciate your time anytime that you give it to us and uh, we hope to see you on a, on a future show. Oh, definitely. Thanks. Right. Thank you, Tanya. <laughs> Bye. And so, Rich, we're waiting just for a few minutes. Uh, and Chris, he's having a little bit of uh, difficulty. So, uh, how are you feeling over there? We're on, you know, we're almost done. We got one more guest, and me and you are going to wrap up. But it's well, been pretty. The coolest people. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, again, when you see all the different people, and I guess it's one of the things that I have always enjoyed about the space community is that you get to see such a wide variety of people. But if anybody who's watched today's webinar, uh, every person that was on here had a spark of inspiration or talked about uh, what drew them into this community. Uh, there are so many different things out there that cause so much dissension, so much noise, so much division, all of those types of things. Uh, we have spent the past several hours here with people who have talked about imagination, creativity, inspiration, uh, being a, a better, uh, better human, a better steward of planet, uh, a better learner and teacher. Again, everything about this has been so exciting to sort of watch. And, and again, today is a day where, again, yeah, we're disappointed we didn't get to launch. But we are talking about something that is going to happen. It is going to be amazing. And it is going to change all of our lives and change history. And people in the space community believe that in their heart. And so to hear the various different stories that people have talked about that it took them, you know, 30 years, as Tim had talked about with his career and other people talked about their frustration, you know, again, believe, work hard, network and don't give up. Uh, I think that is an absolute incredible treatise for anybody in this space community, and everyone can tell you about that story. And so it's been a pleasure to to hear all of those people and hear all of uh, uh, those testimonials. I guess one of the things that has really left out to me, um, I asked someone asked me a number of years ago what I like best about space, <clears throat> and I certainly love all the history of it, and I love all the passion that it generates, but as someone who appreciates art and of lots of visuals, space has all the colors. And if you can't see yourself in something like that, um, I definitely want to help you get an eye exam, but I definitely <laughs> want to work with that person to help them understand how they're connected to it. And that's a challenge. I, I think each of us as communicators who work in the industry uh, work to help the scientist and engineer who can fly your washing machine backwards on the planet of your choice, but may not be able to describe why that's a good idea or a good investment. You know, again, it's, it, no one goes to space alone. It takes a team of talent to make all of this happen. So there is a place in space for everybody. Uh, perfect, perfect, perfect. Chris, welcome. Uh, so Chris was having a bit of technical difficulties, but we got him now. Um, Rich, we'll be back to you in just a few to do our wrap up show after I talk with Chris a little bit about getting humans to Mars. Uh, so thank you, sir. Thank you, Ron. Thanks for having me on. And hi, Rich. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> oh, let me bring him back in. You're going to say hello <laughs> real quick. Hold on. There we Great go. Great to see you, Chris. <laughs> Good to see you. I hope all is well where you're at. Never a dull moment. Well, I think it's only about 30 minutes up the road from you. Rich is in the D.C. area. Are you still there? I wasn't sure if you had, if you had relocated to um, Colorado. No, I was spending an awful lot of time traveling back and forth. But uh, needless to say, uh, I've been stationary uh, in this area, much to my family's chagrin. <laughs> stationary? Why? <laughs> I can't imagine any reason. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> hey, Ray, great to see you. And so... And once again, thanks for having me on, Ron. Uh, I mean, Chris, we're glad to have you on today. I mean, uh, what what else can we talk about here? Uh, but the ultimate uh, goal of the Artemis missions is finally to get humans to Mars. Um, so let's talk a little bit about it. Today would have been the first step. Saturday will be the first step, or whenever it is, the next time that we get uh, they finally get to launch this. This is uh, this is the first. And what can really happen? And man, we've seen a lot of things come close. You know, Constellation was going to do it for a while. There was the journey to Mars, and a lot of those pieces still remain. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. You know, uh, what is, what will this launch eventually lead to? I think this is great because this launch represents even more than getting humans to ISS. That's a great achievement and a whole new model with SpaceX having a you know commercial entities taking this new model to um, bring astronauts to space. And that's great, but it also represents, I think, kind of this inaugural event for what will probably be, um, I think, the greatest decade in the history of human space exploration. 
think about everything that's going to happen during the 2020s. And so I think this is a great start. If we can, if they're successful on Saturday or Sunday of getting launching astronauts to ISS later this year in August, in August, no, uh, yeah, July, we have the launch perseverance. Then, as you mentioned, Artemis, if we can really keep this moving forward, you know, get back to the moon sometime in the mid 2020s and on to Mars in the 2030s. But there's so many other activities. I think we've never been in such a great position. And I think the launch, the SpaceX launch, can serve, even though it's not completely connected to the goals of getting to the, back to the moon and Mars, I think it'll, it'll serve as an enormous motivator. It'll inspire the country, inspire the world. And I think that can play a major role in just keeping up the momentum and making people believe. Uh, incredibly important. And, you know, Mars, Mars is big. I want to go. Let's, let's do this. And uh, so we're talking about SpaceX. Um, you know, obviously NASA's, uh, NASA's got mentioned there was going to be upwards of four missions to Mars this year. A few of those have changed just because of things that are happening. But SpaceX is, is looking at um, also taking people. Starship is being built. Uh, so there's a lot going on. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, maybe their future and what SpaceX is planning on doing. And, uh, you know, what, what kind of your opinion on that? Oh, I think it's exciting. You know, I, I really hope the best for them. You know, we just explore Mars. We don't take signs. We obviously like promoting what the official public um, program is. But if companies like SpaceX or Blue Origin or others can start uh, independent programs, that's great. And so we'll see. I know that uh, Starship is going to be having some very important launches soon. So we'll see how quickly that can develop and what role it can play. But even if that doesn't play, even if SpaceX doesn't have a separate role, you know, get us to Mars separately, finding a way of integrating their technologies into the uh, program of record, uh, hopefully that can be worked out. But regardless, I think there's so much activity right now that did not exist, this hasn't existed in a long time, well, really has never existed. As you mentioned, we've had some programs that have slowed down or changed, altered over years, over presidential administrations. But I think so much, so many capabilities are right on the verge right now that we've never had before. I think we're just about there. So I think, as I said before, I think the next 10 to 15 years are going to be incredible. We're going to see things that we've been dreaming about pretty much forever. And uh, so that's a big focus of the Humans of Mars Summit, which is, uh, you know, one of, it's the, you, probably the premier event when it comes to talking about all the different pieces of what it's going to take to get to Mars. And there's always uh, wonderful panels talking about everything about how are we going to eat on Mars? Well, here's some of the new technologies that are coming out. And I know that's a, a really big piece of it and always putting together really interesting uh, panels that engage the public. And um, it's also, it's not just for industry people. It's not just for um, your, your space enthusiasts. It's a mixture of everything and there's not a whole lot of those. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Explore more or rather the humans to Mars summit is unlike other conferences. The often you'll have the professional conferences on one side You'll have the advocacy uh, conference, another side, <clears throat> STEM, co STEM conferences. We try to find the right blend in a hybrid conference so that you have space professionals there that come in a lar large numbers. We have advocates and students. And we try to find a way to blend the programming so that you have that really firm, solid professional programming that you would find at any of the professional conferences but also make it approachable. Because one of the problems we've had, people have complained for years that, oh, we're just speaking to each other. It's like an echo chamber. It's like we go to a conference, it's the same people we're talking to over and over and over and over. What we've tried to do is, well, remedy that. We obviously need some of the key people every year. So it's not, you know, there's a reason why it's the same people because those are the people who are making it happen. But we like to try to bring in different communities, different industries, students, you know, just the general public. But as you mentioned, even on the topic of feeding Mars, if, if we go to Mars, how are we going to do it? What industries are going to be uh, pivotal to that? Many of them are not related to the space industry. So we love bringing in uh, topics and industries that are not traditionally part of the space industry but could play a huge role in it, you know, whether it be in agriculture or cellular grown meat or other things like that that could play a really major role in sustainable human presence in space. 
and uh, you know, it's it's always appreciated that it opened to new ideas. Last year, uh, Rich, who was been on quite a few times with me today, we we all sat on a panel and discussed the importance of uh, the role of social media in this. And uh, you know, the the virtual world has taken over um, because of everything that's going on. We have become the Digital Space Foundation with all the programs that we have out, and it's been the same for Explore Mars. Uh, the panels uh, that have been coming out have been great. Tomorrow, even there's going to be one on young professionals. Our own Becky is going to be on there because uh, it's going to be about new gen, new space. Base, all the people that are that are coming up right now, and it's going to be really exciting. And uh, so, tell us a little bit about the panels, and obviously the panel that's coming up tomorrow. Oh yeah, well, this is as with everybody else, we've been wanting to do more online programming for some time, but we never really got around to it. And of course, circumstances necessitated it. It forced us to really look at new and innovative ways to get our message out, do programming. So, like everybody else. We launched these webinars as well as these online social events as well, Drinks with Explore Mars. And But as you mentioned, we've been doing it for, I don't know how many weeks now, probably about six or seven weeks. And they've been very successful looking at, once again, looking at all these topics, whether it be mission architecture design, or we even looked at the, you know, had the uh, anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, looking, you know, the topic of life on Mars, but also tomorrow, as you mentioned, um, yeah, young professionals. And I think that one's going to be a really exciting one, looking at all these upcoming professionals working, you know, following their dream as we did as well. And I think it's really important to show that and show students who are in the pipeline right now that this, this is possible. There are role models here. And I, I, think, I think we're really the... Students that are in school right now are going to be perhaps the most important players in the future of space exploration. And they're the ones who are actually going to go. They're the ones who are going to walk on Mars. So we need to really inspire them, show that it's going to be happen, and also show them that they can play a pivotal role in innovating. They can be the innovators. They can be the Elon Musk's or Jeff Bezos's, Jeff Bezos's <laughs> of the future. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, so uh, thank you so much for coming on today. And just so everybody knows with our social media, um, we have some Humans to Mars Summits, uh, su Humans to Mars Summit tickets to give away. There we go. Uh, that we're going to do um, and we're going to be doing that through our social media on Space Foundation. So we're so happy to have you on and talk to us just for a few minutes about all the all the crazy things that are going on in our future on Mars. Chris, uh, thanks for uh, joining us today. Well, thank you. And hopefully um, hopefully there'll be success over the weekend with the um, launch. Absolutely. So, good seeing you, Ron. Good seeing you, Rich. Uh, have a good week. Well, good rest of the week, rather. <laughs> I'm going to sleep. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> All right. Bye. Uh, so, Rich, just to, just to wrap up, man, what, this has been an incredible live stream. Everybody's been on. Um, you know, there's uh, just been so much knowledge shared with us today, and uh, I think it's been incredible. And, and um, you know, so it's been, I mean, wow, this is, uh, you know, what, eight, nine months uh, we've been doing uh, and trying out new things. And I, I think everybody's been pretty excited about it, and I think we've done a pretty good job with it. So uh, what, how would you feel about everything today? Uh, you know, I know people are disappointed, but you know what? Today was a good day for the space community. Uh, today, um, for the first time in a long time, uh, people gathered around TV sets with their screens to stop, pause, and take a look at uh, two of their countrymen uh, getting ready to take off in a brand new vehicle and start a whole new chapter. You know, that's a great day. That's a great day for America. It's a great day for the space community. It's a great day for the world. And, uh, you know, thank you, Ron, for your leadership and your energy in, in this platform and bringing so many different voices that uh, often don't get as much uh, uh, time and attention as they should. And it's one of the things that we do at the Space Foundation very, very well. Bringing people together is both an art, a science, and a privilege. And at the Space Foundation, it is also our honor to do those types of things. So. Uh, want everyone to join us again on Saturday as we, you know, get back together, uh, maybe in uh, a little bit more comfortable attire, uh, weekend attire or whatever. Uh, Ron, that is not inviting you to wear a Hawaiian shirt, but if something tells me you probably have one. But the, uh, what the point is, is that it's a good day for America. We made the right call today. We're going to have a great launch this weekend and even bigger things are going to happen. 
And uh, you know, so let's let's do a couple little plugs here. We've got a lot of things going on. We mentioned CINE earlier. We've got the discoverspace.org website. Uh, kind of let's let's let people in on some of the resources that they have here at the Space Foundation. Um, you know, on our websites to be able to kind of get through this tough time and some of the stuff we have coming up in the future. Absolutely. You know, if you're a person and an entrepreneur uh, or a student who's looking to find your place in the space community, go to spacefoundation.org. Uh, on that site today, you're going to find a lot about our Center for Innovation and Work, uh, Center for Innovation and Education. Uh, that is where anybody should be able to take the first steps to find your place in space. If you're a parent or a student who wants to learn more about space and or a teacher looking for resources on how you can connect with your students online. Uh, if you go to discovery, uh, discoverspace.org, you will find auxilia, which is Latin for helping hand. You will find a number of different pieces of content that will help you as a parent, as a teacher or a student, again, better understand the disciplines that will allow you to access space in all of its different ways. And again, you don't have, space is more than astronauts and rocket scientists. It is environmentalists. It is geospatial leaders. It is data scientists. It is healthcare workers. It is farmers. It is a lot of different things. Um, again, as that phrase goes, if you shoot for the stars and you miss, you're still going to land among them. Uh, again, there are some tremendous opportunities that the Center for Innovation and Education is looking to connect people to. We at the Space Foundation are going to do everything we can to connect folks to those opportunities. And finally, I would be remiss if I didn't again uh, mention again the Space Symposium uh, that will be occurring October 31st through November 2nd. And again, that will be a opportunity for us to not only gather people together physically together for the symposium, but there will also be uh, some digital and online content that we will be looking to announce in the coming weeks as all of those details come together. Space Symposium is about bringing the community together. And the best part about a community is when you can add more people to it because that makes it more vibrant, more diverse, and more creative. And in an industry that is fueled by creativity and diversity and ingenuity, the space community does that better than anybody else. I uh, can't agree enough. And as you can see, I did a share wardrobe change. I had to put you on have my gotten completely casual. I got to tell you, you, you have already done it. And I saw the plug that someone's already asking for you to get a Hawaiian, a Hawaiian shirt. shirt. Yeah. I didn't get casual. I got my official launch America commercial crew transportation shirt in that somebody mailed me overnight. So thank you, Abigail. Uh, one of my friends uh, got a couple of the shirts and sent me one. And uh, so I had to do I did, had to do the whole uh, a whole dress thing. But uh, you know what, man? What a perfect way to, to end it. And I'll get to wear this on Saturday whenever uh, we, we see the launch, hopefully. so. And the, and the challenge will be that, you know, any of these space-themed Hawaiian shirts that show up to you or that you are checking out on Amazon at the conclusion of this, I can only imagine what you're going to come up with. Uh, and you know what? Funny enough, there is somebody that I think does something that's in the realm of a space Hawaiian shirt. She actually brings them to Space Fest. I've seen a couple of them before that kind of have that look, um, but it's it's space themed. So maybe that's it there. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll see. I'll have to talk to her about it. Uh, Michelle Roach, is, I think is her name, Rouch. I can't remember exactly how she says her last name, but uh, she's a great artist. And, you know, we talked about everything today. We talked about we've talked about STEM, we've talked about STEAM, we've talked about you know the missions to Mars and all this stuff. It's been an incredible, uh, incredible adventure with you uh, all joining us today. Um, we've had so many people watching. We cannot thank you enough for joining us. We are going to do a watch party on Saturday. It won't be as in depth as today, but we just had too many great guests to um, to, to to stop this, and uh, we just had to roll with it. And we're so glad you stuck with us. Um, the majority of the time, everybody has, even after the launch, our our audience grew. So thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, do make sure to check out all of our web websites, uh, discoverspace.org for all that digital content for teachers, parents, and students. And of course, you can support us, uh, the Space Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit by visiting uh, www.spacefoundation.org backslash donate. And on all these outlets and more, it's our goal to inspire, educate, connect, and advocate for the space community because at the Space Foundation, we will always have space for you. Thank you all, and we will see you soon.